Hello and welcome back to Dr. Hollowed. In today's episode, we are taking a look at the most terrifying encounters in the woods by outdoorsmen. Please like and subscribe to support us. Six apostrophe two. My horses are very calm and relaxed, very trusting horses but the only time I've ever seen them bolt the other direction is when a barn mate of mine was screaming because she ripped her leg open. I kid you not this man started full speed sprinting at us with a knife in one hand and something black and moldy looking in the other, this is a rural park of Vermont may I say, the only time there's people there is when they're hiking and no one is allowed to camp there due to wildlife and hunting seasons. This man had a full beard that looked like he had mange, his skin was covered in dirt and he had cargo pants and a dark green shirt on, he definitely was not a hunter. Like, I've never seen anything like that before. Both the horses booked it with me nearly falling off, I don't think I will ever be able to go near that forest again. Me and a few friends of mine take yearly backpacking slash bushwhacking trips in central Pennsylvania, usually around Memorial Day. Back in 2018 we struck out on a planned 4 day hump, 12 miles in and 12 out. Day 1 was 75-ish degrees, day 2 it started pouring rain and the temperature dropped to about 45 to 50. For the next two days the rain didn't stop and the days slash nights became increasingly cold, I'd guess lows of mid-30s. All of our gear soaked through and we were unable to get a large enough fire going to properly dry them and ourselves out, luckily, we had picked up two road flares on the way in and were able to use them to get small ones going. Day 4 rolls around and none of our electronics are working, not that we could have called anyone BC there was no service, but also our maps, food and clothing had soaked through. To make matters worse, we had a black bear, adolescent, that started following us. One of our group began displaying signs of hyperthermia so we made the decision to ditch all of our gear and beeline it to the nearest logging trail. At this point, myself and the others were near delirium. I was hallucinating and losing the ability to form coherent sentences. Halfway through the extract, I turn around can find my friend anywhere. So we double back to find him and when we do he'd gone completely hyperthermic, unable to move on his own and talking nonsense, mind you it had only taken us 20 or 30 minutes to find him. We got him to his feet, found the logging trail, almost had to shoot aforementioned bear, false charged us, and managed to find a DNR officer making the rounds who gave us a lift back to our vehicles. The death hike has been a yearly tradition since, albeit a much safer and more prepared version. At the age of around 13, we used to party on a small hiker's hut in the woods of rural Germany. In order to avoid trouble with our parents for getting drunk, we usually would just camp there overnight. One night, after getting somewhat drunk, everyone suddenly decides to go home. Me, not wanting to explain to my parents why I would show up drunk in the middle of the night, decides to spend the night alone at the hut. The hut itself was open on one side and had benches around the edges inside. So I grab my sleeping bag and lie down under one of the benches. After some time, I wake up hearing something that sounded like someone pushing over trees and running through the woods in close vicinity. I am creeped out by this and decide to lay still and listen. But the noises come closer and closer until the source of it is in the hut right besides me. I take a peek, having crept as deep in my sleeping bag as I could, and lo and behold, not one, but two boars are rummaging through the hut, most likely attracted by leftover food. Suddenly one of the boars starts sniffing my head. I'm scared shitless at this point, being 13 and alone in the woods, and with no way to run or defend myself, lying in a sleeping bag on the floor with two walls beside me and the bench on top, I just play dead and hope for the best. Turned out to be the right call as the boars lost interest in me, found some food and left a while later. Shocked after the experience, I lay awake the rest of the night until dawn, when I wanted to at least get a little sleep before heading home. That was when the woodpecker started hammering right above me. Overall terrible experience. Being harried by coyotes while helping my mom get down a 8 mile and elevation heavy trail during late evening and well into the night after she twisted her ankle and knee horribly with two young, under 10, siblings. No one answered our radios and so dad went to get help. They came so close I could reach them and were extremely aggressive and had no qualms about showing us their numbers. I frankly didn't think we'd make it out with mom. She even whispered to me you leave me, you take the kids, and you run. Cover their ears and pretend everything is fine if I scream. A son should never ever hear that from their mother especially at just 16 years old. Dad finally came with some volunteers and rangers and met us 2 slash 3 RDS the way down. They ended up tracking and killing those coyotes. To this day I wonder if we should have stayed where we were or did what we did. On the one hand they say never move especially with an injured person. On the other hand how much longer before they struck? How much longer would it have taken dad and them to get to us? 
In the summer of 2014 I was in remote Alsea, Oregon. As in, remote for Alsea, which is already pretty remote in the middle of the coastal mountain range. It was dark and I figured I'd save myself some time trying to get back to my campsite by cutting across a creek and through the woods. I knew from previous research on Google Earth that this was possible. Rather than walk a path and cross a footbridge, I would save roughly a half hour to cut through. What I hadn't anticipated is such thick vegetation off path that there was scarcely ground to walk on. It was very dark except for the moon and stars peeking through the clouds occasionally, dense with massive ferns and vinay maple I just kept squeezing between the sticks and foliage. At what I figured was about the halfway point between where I started my shortcut and where my friends up at the campsite were, I could hear their laughter and soft music in the distance which gave me invigorated energy, I knew I was going the right way and couldn't wait to surprise them coming from out of the woods rather than the path. This was as much about showing off as it was saving time. Not long after I stopped because I thought I heard something off to my right, several footsteps in quick succession. My blood ran cold, I felt like time had slowed down, in this shit I could barely drudge through, something was running at me. As soon as I turned to my right to face whatever was coming my way I am face to face with it. The most beautiful woman I had ever seen in my life. She had pale skin that glowed in the light of the moon and massive eyes that I could see the stars reflected in, black hair down to her shoulders at least. I was fixated and terrified, I couldn't look away or muster the courage to speak at all. I was so intimidated by her beauty, were face to face close enough to kiss, close enough to smell that she reeked of lichen and moss so much so I could taste the mineral metallic taste of the fragrance. For the first time in my life I was afraid of how beautiful someone was, she didn't seem human. She'd run up so fast and was instantly in my face, silent SND still. Tears were beginning to well up in my eyes and the intense pressure of her presence felt like it was crushing me. I was absolutely certain I was about to die and it would be at her hands, or maybe I already was dead and this was the face of God. Somehow, I gathered just enough courage to squeak out a hello? And move my head back just a couple inches. My eyes refocused. I was face to face with a massive maple leaf about the size of my head. Have you ever had a dream you were talking with friends or on the phone, but then you wake up and realize you were actually alone? That same feeling crept over me, like someone was just there, now there weren't. I had the dim light of my phone, but there was nothing to see around me but the same thick vegetation I'd been trudging through the whole time. I eventually made it to camp but I was so stunned by the experience I just had I couldn't really get into the spirit of it. I had just come across a specter of some sort, a guardian of the forest who was angered by my presence. I couldn't see it on her face, but I just felt as though I was in trouble the way a child would be if they were caught doing something wrong. I told my friends that I had seen a ghost, they laughed it off, dismissed it as me trying to tell a spooky campfire story. I've never seen anything like that again, I also don't trek off trail anymore. Cougars, bears, wild dogs, hermits. Nothing else I've ever encountered in the woods has so thoroughly induced pure terror quite like the beautiful woman who walked through the trees. Not me but my buddy, he's the most outdoorsy person I know and has some stories to tell. This is my favorite one though. For some background, he used to work for the forest services, fighting wildfires out west in no man's land kind of areas. After his season one year, he took some guys on a big game hunting trip on public land he saw when fighting fires. Deep deep in the middle of nowhere Idaho or something. They ended up getting a couple of deer and one guy had to leave to catch a flight. So the party split up and sent all the guys but him back to the trucks with the deer he shot, while my buddy stayed back to watch the other deer they shot. It was a good 10 plus miles out from the road, so they wouldn't be back for a whole day, where he waited by himself. The night he's watching it, he's sitting at a small fire with his back to a tree about to fall asleep. When a mountain lion jumps over the tree he's sitting against, goes around the fire and goes for the deer carcass. He said he wasn't in arm's reach of his bag where his pistol was, so he grabbed a big rock and threw it at the lion and yelled at it. The mountain lion slumped back into the darkness and he lost track of it. The rest of the night he said he was wide awake clutching his pistol in one hand, and bag wrapped around his arm to use as a shield in his other. It didn't come back out but he was able to see its eyes from time to time lurking in the darkness, just waiting for him to fall asleep. Not even in the woods. I'm fine in the woods. Could be days, weather could suck, no problem. In a regular campground. I was around 11 or 12, and my pop and I had gone on our yearly camping trip. We pulled into this campground mid-afternoon, picked a beautiful spot not 60 yards from the river, had a great swim, and some sandwiches. We got the tent set up early, and as the sun began to set, a light sprinkle set in. No big deal, right? We had the tent, and our sleeping bags ready to go. Reader, we had no idea what was coming. As the last rays of the sun faded, the wind picked up. And up. And up. Never before, or since, 
have I experienced such meteorological phenomena. I've since been in torrential downpours that physically slowed the vehicle I was driving, and snowstorms that reduced visibility to a meter or less. This was not like either of those. This windstorm had teeth. The wind was out for blood, and would not be stayed. I've mentioned that we were in a tent. It was a three-man nylon unit, of a dome design, which was the cutting edge of camping technology at the time. Our annoyance quickly grew to concern, as the ever-increasing gale began to bow to the wall in, on the windward side. It bowed. It bent. My sheer terror reached a fever pitch, as the tent blew flat over us, encasing us in a nylon burrito of sodden death. Had a sudden reversal of gusts reinflated our poor bedraggled temporary tomb. Well, remember that river I mentioned? 60 yards ain't nothing to a makeshift parasail. Well, we, I, eventually fell asleep out of sheer exhaustive terror. We woke to a sunny, if cool, morning, with much debris strewn throughout the campground. I asked my dad, geez, what if a big branch, or a tree had fallen on us? Well, he says, it suddenly wouldn't have been our problem, anymore. Ever the stoic, he never mentioned our proximity to that damn river for 30 years. I'll never forget that experience, or how he tried to keep me calm, and reassure me. A living treasure, and a treasured memory. My brother and I were making the mile-long hike to our deer stands at about 5 a.m. so it was pitch black. It was late fall so peak rutting season for deer and the bucks in the area were filled with testosterone and aggression, by far the most exciting time of year to hunt. We liked to let our eyes adjust to the dark for 20 or so minutes before beginning the hike so that we wouldn't have to use flashlights in an attempt to not alert any deer to our presence in the area. The route we took included walking along some deer trails as the area was pretty thick with vegetation and otherwise would be very difficult slash loud to traverse. Around 12 minutes into our transit we heard this extremely loud crashing about 100 yards up the ridge we were walking on. We both froze to listen to the commotion and it was pretty clear that it was two large bucks fighting each other up the ridge. Antlers clashing, branches breaking, vegetation being mowed over, the whole nine yards. The bucks must have heard us shuffling around on the trail when we started to move again because the sounds of fighting stopped. We then heard the unmistakable sound of heavy hooves pounding into the ground and running, but the sound was getting louder and louder. I realized that the buck was on the same trail we were walking on and he was charging towards us. The trail made a 90 degrees turn about 20 feet ahead of us and I heard the buck quickly closing the distance. I knew he was on track to make the turn and be facing us within seconds. As soon as the sound reached the turn in front of us I was met with this huge mass bounding towards me with its head down. I grabbed my bow and held it in front of me and without thinking just screamed as loud as I could hey. 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 The buck immediately veered away from us and quickly ran away. I figure he must have thought we were deer since we were walking on the same deer trail he was on and, being filled with the aggression from the fight, was charging us to run us out of his territory. I had never heard of people getting charged by deer before and if it didn't happen to me personally, would probably have a hard time believing a story like this could happen. Definitely needed a new pair of underwear after that experience. About 15 miles from the trailhead in the Wind River Range in Wyoming, set up camp for the night after an exhausting day of fly fishing and hiking. Mind you I was 20 years old, and alone and the spooky shot happened at about 10 pm. I had a 10mm Glock, bear spray and a flare gun so I figured I was good to go. Walked up to an old abandoned cabin on the way up, that had a bunch of pentagrams and shit all over the floor. Dead shit hanging in the trees, and I giggled because I know people do that for shits and giggles. The ground was covered in this wildly red moss, that I have seen before, but goddamn there was a lot. I was juiced about to fall asleep after eating, and having a little pull of my flask, when I heard human footsteps. I got silent and listened to them walk right up to the tent, but about 20 feet away I said hey motherfucker what do you want? A really calm woman's voice answered me back, and said could I please come in your tent? I said no and you need to leave I was scarred shitless and had my Glock in my hand. She, or it, replied back and said okay, then turned around and walked off directly into the dark old growth timer. About 30 seconds later I heard branches breaking and rocks tumbling. I looked the next morning after zero fucking sleep and found no footsteps but all the broken timber. Needless to say I don't go up that drainage fishing alone anymore. The most terrifying moment was ironically on the very outskirts of the woods. As a teenager, my parents, my sister, and I used to travel the US each summer in our motor home. One summer, we pulled into a campground on the northern coast of Washington that was completely empty, which is pretty unusual, I've been to hundreds, maybe thousands, of campgrounds over the years and it might be the only one I've been to like it. It was a nice sunny day, so we thought nothing of it and spent the afternoon hiking. In the evening, the fog came in and it got really eerie, you could only see maybe 10 to 15 feet and it got super quiet. 
Normally the woods are fairly loud, there are lots of birds, insects, small woodland creatures, etc. making a lot of noise, and things only get quiet when predators are near. I remember remarking to my dad that the place had gotten pretty eerie, and he quipped back that it was like the start of a horror movie. Maybe 15 to 20 minutes later, the single pay phone next to the campground bathroom started ringing. My mom decided it might be a ranger or someone calling for us, seriously? And went and picked it up. All she got on the other end was heavy breathing. We threw our stuff into the motor home and noped right out of there, and ended up stopping for the night in a Walmart parking lot maybe 45 minutes away. In retrospect, it was probably some teens trying to be funny and scare us, but my mom still likes to talk about the time we escaped the clutches of a serial killer. I was 17 at the time. We lived next to a very big forest and I loved spending time in it. After many years spent in it I knew that forest like the back of my own hand and would often walk far away from the trails to get away from other people. One day I was walking through an area thick with trees and wasn't paying attention to my surroundings. My phone had frozen, I wanted to change the song currently playing. After a minute or so I look up, and before me stands a half-naked man. I see a little tent a couple meters up on the mountainside. No one has ever set up tents in this area, otherwise I would not be here. I will never forget his face. He smiled at me. It sent shivers down my spine and my brain kept screaming GTFO. I thought he was going to kill me. I thought he was going to rape me in that tent and dispose of my body somewhere afterwards. I completely froze and we just looked at one another for what felt like a couple minutes. His naked upper body was pure muscle. Yep, this man can take me out no problem. He stands tilde 3 meters away from me. He starts slowly walking towards me, no words exchanged. He looks like he will be able to outrun me. I decide to pretend to talk to my mother on my phone, but the fucking thing is still frozen so when I unplug the headphones it just starts blasting music so now I just blew my cover and he knows it. I started to run. Zigzag as fast as I could. Thankfully, after having spent countless days in that forest I knew where the closest path was. I found a group of older folks having a Sunday stroll and jumped on their tail, following them all the way out of there. I went back to the place a month later and saw no trace of him or his camp. Never saw him or anyone else there ever again. I don't know what would have happened to me if the elderly group wasn't there at that day and time, and I don't like to think about it. The first time I ever went hunting for white-tailed deer was when I was about 12 years old. I went with my friend's dad and my friend in Rushford, New York. Both of them were experienced hunters. My friend's father set me and my friend up in a tree line facing an open grove and proceeded to walk and set himself up about 300 yards away further into the woods. We were close enough to feel safe, but far enough away that we couldn't see each other. Anyways, my friend and I were up all night playing rock band. We had to finish the endless set list. So we were running on two hours of sleep. Needless to say, my friend and I fell asleep on our fallen tree trunk immediately after we stopped hearing his father's footsteps. Don't know how long I was out, but upon waking, I came to with the sight of a very large brown bear digging in my jacket pocket eating my granola bars. I was so terrified that I couldn't do anything but stay as still as possible. I didn't have the courage to make a single noise. My friend was still snoring next to me. I then proceeded to piss and shit myself. I'm not sure if the bear got bored, or the smell of my fear induced shitty pants made him lose his appetite, but it walked away after finishing my snacks I had stored in my pockets. I still have never experienced fear like this. I am now 32 years old. Camping in Tasmania. There was an isolated beach on the other side of a hill called Mays Beach. Me and some friends used to camp there from time to time, get pissed, get stoned, cook some food. Word got around about the good times we had there so one weekend we had about a dozen kids from our high school and girls with us, sweet lord the anticipation, all heading out for some fun. We were leading the party to this secluded beach of ours but it was a slog to get there and hot teenage girls are not generally renowned for their long distance bushwalking endurance at the best of times let alone with slabs of beer, casks of wine, tents and sleeping gear so the complaining got to the extent that it was general consensus to stop here, right here, right now and set up camp. At late afternoon in some isolated dryland area. Tents were set up, campfire lit. It would have been about an hour later when this ute with hunting spotters comes raging through the bush and starts circling us. Loud, aggressive. The ute pulls right up into the midst of our camp and this guy gets out and leeringly informs us we were camping on his land and we'd stolen his firewood and we owed him. Standing in the back of the ute holding onto the roof racks were two of the creepiest men I have ever seen. Holding shotguns. Each wearing nothing more than jocks and an insidious grin. They eyed those girls droolingly while we packed up camp faster and more apologetically than anyone had ever packed anything up ever. 
lots of nodding looks and sideways glances were exchanged between those men. I don't think they were expecting there to be as many of us. They seemed frustrated and edgy once they realized. Thank the gods above we had numbers because they watched us menacingly for a long time as we left that area before they roared off through the bush with a couple of rounds fired over our heads as a parting gift. So, so fucking Wolf Creek creepy. Ended up being a really good night in the end though. Did a lot of field work for my thesis in South Africa. A few times a week, I'd hike up to my research area, on top of a cliff, about an hour walk slash climb. Always by myself, camera in hand in case I see something cool, like a kudu jumping away. When I reach the first plateau, I walk along the cliff as usual, but in the bushes up ahead, I hear rustling of leaves. So, I slow down, get my camera ready and walk towards the bush. It is pretty thick, so I can't see anything, but the noise is still there. At this point, I'm a few meters away from the bush and I still can't see shit. One more step and from the bush comes a massive roar. I shit you not, it was like the MGM lion. Instinct took over and I bolted, running away from the bush. I still have the sound of my Teva sandals flapping on the hard rock beneath my feet. Then I remembered that big cats have a tendency to instinctively chase stuff that runs away, so I stop and turned around. Nothing behind me. I'm about 30 meters away from the bush, and there are still angry growling sounds coming from the bush. I really want to know what it is, so I hunch down, camera in hand. But the angry growling noises don't stop, so I'm thinking, do I really want to provoke an angry animal that feels trapped in a bush? So, slowly I make my way back to the climb where I wait for half an hour or so. Then I resumed my path next to the bush but everything was clear. I hate that I didn't see what it was. My best guess would be leopard as the area is teeming with them, but they don't really roar. Lions don't really roam free in South Africa, except for maybe the most northern part close to Botswana. My area wasn't too far from it, but lions haven't been spotted there for decades. Another option might be a clever bush pig maybe, or smaller carnivore pretending to be a big cat, but yeesh, the roar was loud. So I'm only left with this story to tell, no photos of proof. I don't think actual proof would be worth getting mauled over by a leopard, so perhaps I made the right choice. When I was growing up, my family had a farm in a semi-rural spot in Australia that backed onto a national park. One afternoon in mid-January, it got unbearably warm, so I decided to hike down to a creek in the national park that had some fairly deep rock pools, and go for a swim. On my way down, I had to make my way through some long, dry grass. As I was walking through the grass, I almost trod on an eastern brown snake, the second most venomous snake in the world, that was dozing on a hot rock. I've dealt with my fair share of brown snakes before, and my experience is that if you don't make any sudden movements, and move slowly away, they generally ignore you. This snake, however, did not follow the standard reaction of looking vaguely threatening and falling back to sleep once I left. This snake decided that I had insulted its snake ancestors in some way, or maybe I was just near its nest. Either way, it lunged directly for my legs. I got lucky, and it missed, but it then decided that lunging at me still wasn't enough, and it chased me across the whole paddock. I've never seen a snake act like that before, and it was completely terrifying. Easily top 5 scariest things that have ever happened to me. This is a creepy human story, nothing supernatural or really even woodsy about it. I was once having a hike in my favorite preserve in southwest Florida. The preserve has a very large loop trail, and then there are a bunch of paths that cut across to the return side so you can make a shorter loop if you want. They weren't super well marked, so it's kinda easy to turn the wrong way and accidentally take a smaller loop. I knew the preserve very well, though. I had been there dozens of times, and I had encountered exactly two people in the hundreds of miles I hiked there. So one day I'm hiking out, and near the beginning of the trail there's this one leg that's not part of the loop trail it goes down to the river. And this guy is coming back from it. I had seen one car in the lot, so makes sense. A lot of people would just hike to the river, since it was short and easy. But I turn right towards the loop and carry on. After a while, I notice the guy is following along, a ways back. He's a tall white man, 50s, nicely dressed in khaki outdoor pants, keen style sandals, and a Columbia polo. Well groomed. Probably 200 yards back. I keep on, keep on, expecting to lose him at one of the turns. I know he doesn't have a map, he's not carrying anything, and I assume not many people know the route by heart. But there he is, behind me, and I don't know. I just got this feeling. The feeling kept on, and after a couple more opportunities to not follow me, I decide to do force the issue. My girlfriend had just bought me a K-bar knife, and I had it along. At the next fork, there was a bench to rest. 
I decided to sit there, knife available and on display, and force him to pass me. He'd choose a direction, and I planned to wait a while, then choose the other direction. So I sat, and I waited. And waited. And he just never came. So, I figured I was wrong. I had an okay rest of my hike, but I was still a bit wary about leaving. I just felt like he might be there. But he wasn't. So I got back in my 87 Mustang. I always left the sunroof open to vent the hot air. And that guy wrote me a note, and dropped it in the sunroof. I kept it in my wallet for a while. It looked like a kindergarten level handwriting ability, and it said something about wishing he could show me his penis. Sorry, haven't had it in a couple of decades now. That's the honest account of the creepiest thing that ever happened to me in the woods. I've been living in the forest now for 7 years, and haven't faced anything scarier than a copperhead or a black bear. Honestly, I hate lightning more than anything else when I'm in the woods. That day in the preserve was the day I learned to trust your gut. Actually, if you didn't know, your gut has neurons. It actually computes things. My gut knew something was wrong, even while my brain tried to convince me it was fine. As a kid especially, and still now, I was book smart, and not street smart, so my gut had to do that thinking for me. I called the cops, they wouldn't even take a report. In retrospect, I think I made a mistake waiting for him. If I fought that crazy man in the middle of the woods, we would have been fighting on his terms. No rules, no mercy, no ritos. Someone would have died, and it very well could have been me. I'm glad I had the courage to fight, but I hope next time I have the wisdom to leave. Lil late to this thread but I go out backcountry camping with my sister fairly regularly. I think the most memorably freaky thing we experienced was a series of things that occurred while camping in Nat Creek between Astoria and Portland. The first night, we were at the campground over there. I was up until roughly 4 to 5 am in my hammock due to some people on drugs getting in fights. Eventually the police showed up and things calmed down. Next day we ended up moving off further into the woods to camp, away from the campground. Things were going great, we were all set up. Up until a sheriff came down the road and hopped out the car, came over to us and then asked if we had seen a bloodied up pregnant woman going down the road or a silver Chevy truck. We figured this was all a fluke of crappy coincidence so we ended up coming back a few weeks later to camp, again. We aren't unfamiliar with looking for places to camp in the wee hours, so we were just going down some old forestry roads looking for a good spot. My sister ended up turning to me and told me she saw a foot in the road. Turned out to be a bare paw, pretty dang small and all the claws were cut off. Us, being the smart outdoorsmen that we are, then got out of the car and proceeded to check it out further, following several other bits of bare paw into the woods as well as some other pieces. Mind you, it was about 12 am. Then to make matters even better, we ended up going further down the road to check it out and came up on a campsite at the end of it, with even more bits of bare, fresh. I don't remember all that was there because we were only out of the car for maybe 15 seconds before my sister heard a man shouting from the woods and running towards us. We booked it the hell out of there, collected ourselves, then realized that we likely just ran into poachers. We called it in, in the morning but when they got back to us, everything was gone. I have some photos of the paws but I guess the lesson here is to maybe not follow the severed pieces of bear into the woods? Needless to say we don't camp in that area anymore. We've had some other freaky experiences in the woods and I'm sure there will be more to come. People are the scariest thing in the woods. Not really terrifying, more like unsettling. I was hiking alone a few years ago and it was nothing out of the ordinary, until the birds went completely quiet and I stopped and listened for a second. I didn't hear anything, but I turned around and looked behind me and barely caught a glimpse of fur from something trotting right behind this embankment. It was moving off to the side and away from me. I started to walk again, this time more cautiously, and I was looking around a lot more, than I actually spotted what it was. I saw a furry tail again and saw a coyote about 200 feet away. He was trotting by and staring at me. Seconds later I spotted two more on the other side of the trail doing the same thing and I realized what was happening. These fucking things were stalking me. They were moving almost silently and not barking, howling, or making any kind of noise. That's when I started to get scared and I had my knife in my hand the last two miles of the hike. I think they were debating if I was worth going after. It was freaky. I live in Australia, I used to love going into a huge nature reserve to smoke weed and enjoy the bushland around me. This place was amazing. It had you surrounded on all sides by nature. I found a lot of peace there and it quickly became my go-to spot to sesh. One day I walked the usual path through the bush I always took and something visceral caught my eye, someone had nailed a crow onto a tree, at eye level. It was freaky as fuck. It was like someone knew I was going there and was trying to fuck with me. I gathered myself and kept walking the trail, 
I eventually forgot about the crow and I found a lookout spot that could only be accessed by walking past a small path in a group of bushes. I could see the ocean from the top of this hill and all the nature below, I began to smoke loads of bongs and just chilled while I was taking it all in. I fell asleep because I was so relaxed and baked, I woke up about 4 hours later and it was about 9 pm, I was in the middle of the bush reserve and it was pitch black. I was no longer high, just hyper aware. I walked down my hill and tried to make my way to the entrance of the bush reserve. I had my phone's torch on and I was walking to the bottom of the hill. I heard the sound of someone running in the distance, I was freaked out now and stopped to gather my nerves before continuing. I walked through a grove of bushes and I could feel someone watching me, I heard footsteps and low murmuring. My blood ran cold and I knew someone was watching me, I had a strong suspicion it was the guy who nailed the crow up for me to see. I snuck into a bush and sat down, the only light came from the stars and they lit up the silhouettes of the surroundings. I reached to my side and found a large tree branch that was like a club. I picked it up and then I crept out of my hiding position, I could hear footsteps circling in my vicinity. I suck out and then I began to walk out towards the exit and I caught the outline of a figure standing in the way. They could see my outline and could see the shape of a tree branch in my hands. They saw this and ran into the nearest bush and ran deep into the reserve. I was freaked out, I was shaking and I then bolted as quick as I could for the entrance. I got out and had to walk home, I was checking over my shoulder for most of the walk back. I know if I didn't find that tree branch next to me that this freak would have tried to kill me. Whoever they were, they had been stalking me all day and were waiting for the perfect time to attack me. Not many people knew the spot I had found, but one person had followed me. They were waiting for me. I never went back to this place after and two months later I gave up weed for good, this event scared me so much that I didn't want to put myself in that danger again. When I was in basic training for the French army, I did some time in Verdun. You do field training in the woods, battlefields and forts from World War I. So basically you sleep in former bomb craters, trenches and our forts. I can tell you that the atmosphere is different over there. Even in the city. It is charged with. Dread if I had to put a word to it. Anyway, sleeping in those forests during winter is a physical challenge but the hardest was on the mind. Your mind creates all sorts of stuff, or at least that's how I reassure myself, from seeing things to hearing things. Worst I had was when sleeping in a foxhole with three other guys and we took turn watching a dark part of the forest during icy rainy night. Took my turn and I could swear there was a figure popping out of behind a tree and staying still. Like just shoulders and head. I was so uneasy and cold. Fucked up thing is everyone in the foxhole noticed this figure. When day came we went to the area where the figure should have been and there was nothing round like a head. We had to head back because we came to a forbidden part of the field, had some bombs and ammo around. I'm really into herps so I take a lot of night hikes, that's when amphibians tend to be out and about. In the mountains near where I used to live I had a favorite little pull-off spot probably a half hour drive into national forest territory, no trail, no parking area, just a little wide spot on the shoulder where I'd stop the car and walk along a creek looking for salamanders. It's worth mentioning that I'd never seen another person in years of going here. One time, I'd parked and started walking through the quiet woods when I suddenly heard music out of nowhere like a group of people singing and playing spirituals on guitar. Except there were no trails and no cars anywhere even close to nearby, probably another 20 minute drive to a backpacking trailhead and all the trails went the opposite direction. Which means any group of people would have had to backpack, with guitars, through thick rhododendron woods with no trail to a steep mountainside where they would have to be sitting in the dense woods. I even turned my light off to see if I could spot a campfire but there was nothing, just quiet spiritual music. It is by far the most fear I have ever felt in my woods. I have never felt more afraid than necessary when meeting a bear or coyote or snake at night but that gentle music floating through the pitch black woods in an empty area of national forest made all my hair stand on end. I left immediately. I've been back many times and that has never happened again. When I was younger, I used to live on a large section of land in the Colorado Rockies. I used to feed the foxes hot dogs on my porch every night, and when we went hunting we would shoot a squirrel or two and toss them out by where they were camped out, and watch them get very excited. It was all very wholesome, and fun to watch how they grew, died, and grew again. I swear there was about 40 of them that would show up, nightly. One year, the foxes stopped coming to our porch. One night a week might not have been odd. Maybe even two. But after a solid week of no foxes, my then stepfather and I got concerned. After that week, the very next morning we went outside to see if we could find a reason why. Well, plain as day, in the snow right outside, were absolutely massive mountain lion paw prints. This thing must have been gigantic. So we go looking for it. 
get a tag from the Dow, and decide we're going to hunt this thing for our foxes. It took about two weeks, still not seeing any foxes, before we even found sign of it again. We were about six miles from our house, deep in the forest, and it yowls from somewhere. If you've never heard a mountain lion roar, it's not a roar. It sounds like a scream, and it rattled right through me. My stepdad knew it while close, but we couldn't see it. We decided to turn around and head home. About halfway home, we both stop walking because we smell something close to us. Hunters probably know you get used to what animals smell like when they're close. I remember the way deer and bear smell, and this wasn't it. It just smelled like blood. And after looking in all direction around us, I finally look up above us into the trees and there it was. The biggest most massive cat there ever was perched right above us, looking down. Its muscles were rippled and I remember my heart stopping in my throat. My stepdad was also spooked. He fired the .22 up at it, and I'm sure he missed. The mountain lion jumped down, ran off and I don't remember ever seeing it again. A week later the foxes came back though. This just happened last night. It was close to midnight and we were doing a field training exercise. I turned on my night vision goggles and saw a three-man team setting up what looked like a M19 or some other large weapon system on a tripod. I had three other people in my squad confirm and we were ready to engage. We radioed it up to see if we could engage but our lane walkers were really confused because they hadn't sent any enemies out there. I fired a couple rounds of blanks then they all disappeared. Turns out every rotation that comes through and pulled security on that side of the woods had seen the exact same thing. There was never anything there. Lane walkers and other soldiers reported seeing orbs, men running through the woods, and hearing their names whispered at night. This was also on an old Civil War battlefield not far from an Indian burial ground. We ended up putting our sleeping bags a but closer together after that. I had just moved up to Queensland Australia from the south coast. I've lived in Oz my whole life and have camped a lot so I've heard strange things before but there was always an explanation, possums and foxes are common hectic sounds decided to go find somewhere nice to camp for a couple of nights. I drove off alone without telling anyone, I didn't have friends there yet, into the bush, park my car and walk about one hour in so I wasn't near the Ophical campsites where my car was parked. Set up my tent ek did my evening and went to bed early, around 9pm a while it was still twilight. Laying on my back I hear screams that sounded like a 12 year old girl being skinned alive. It came from multiple directions. I didn't sleep at all, just lay on my back holding my knife on my chest and waited. I couldn't think of any animal that would make the sound so assumed I was going to get eaten slash murdered by some unknown assailant. At first light the screen stoked, I packed up my shit and hoofed it back to my car. Still scared and confused. When I got to my car the local ranger was there, they do the rounds at Ophical campsites to get money and check facilities. He asked me if I was okay because I looked horrible from no sleep and had badly packed my pack in my hurry so I was half carrying my stuff. I explained what I had experienced and he gave a chuckle and said on oh, nothing like camping in the bush during koala mating season. Apparently those cute stone motherfuckers just scream across the trees when they want sex. Where I grew up we don't have koalas so I'd never experienced their sexual glory cries. So as an astrophotographer, it is my job to go out into the middle of nowhere in the middle of the night, and when there's a new moon nonetheless. So I'm about 35 miles away from the nearest lamp post or gas station and I start setting up my camera and tripod and such. Bear in mind too that I'm not just on the side of the road, I'm about 10 miles down some old forest service road off of another service road, off of a paved road, off of the highway. Also, I've been to this spot many times and I've only ever seen a camper van on the side of the highway, not way back off some dirt road where I take my pictures. So anyway, I get my camera set up and my shutter remote plugged in and I start taking photos with 30 seconds exposures. During these 30 seconds per photo, I can't have my light on or it blows out the shot. I also hesitate to move because if I bump my tripod the shot is trash. After about 6 photos, 3 or 4 minutes of shooting, I get a bad feeling. My stomach drops and I start sweating. I'm mid-shot so I don't want to move or turn on my light so I'm in a weird position. You know how you can feel something's about to touch you if it's super close? Like try it right now hover your finger over the bridge of your nose. It feels unnatural right? Well that's the feeling I felt regarding the entire right side of my body. It felt like someone was standing right next to me but I couldn't move or turn on my light because I didn't want to mess up the shot being taken. Well you'd better believe that after a few seconds I said screw the shot I don't want to die. So I whip my head over, turn on my light, and dear god. It's a man. There is a man out among the sagebrush, and he appears to be sitting in an outhouse with the door open, one of those ye old wooden outhouses. 
Well I myself just about needed an outhouse of my own at this point. I move my light over on the horizon to see if there's anything else, and there's not. But, when I turn the light back to where this man was, there's nothing. He could have only been about 150 yards out so it's not like I would have needed binos or anything to clarify what I saw. But he was gone and so was his outhouse. Now I'd love to tell you that he was behind me or ended up in my car but that was it. So naturally, I literally threw everything into my car and went home going about 90 miles per hour on a dirt road. Got home and nearly cried I was so scared. It's not bears or cougars or snakes that scare me out in the woods. It's people. Stay safe out there. Not an outdoorsman, but I feel like this fits here. My dad, 56, and I, 12, were hiking. Before I get any further, I have to get into my dad's background. My dad has diagnosed antisocial personality disorder. He can never ever be wrong. He could be claiming that 2 plus 2 equals 5, and he'd still win the argument because there is no getting through to him. He was also extremely abusive to me. However, at the time, I didn't see him as abusive because I didn't have a good frame of reference for how fathers are supposed to behave. I have since gone no contact. But getting to the story, we were hiking in the Rocky Mountains in Colorado. We went up to one of our favorite trails on a 14er. We were at about 11,000 feet when we hit a snowstorm. The snow was so heavy that we couldn't see the trail. We'd been on this route at least 10 times before, and my dad assured me that he knew the way. Spoilers, he did not know the way. In fact, my dad has the worst sense of direction I have ever encountered. We kept going, but as we went on, I stopped recognizing the landmarks. Every time I voiced this concern, my dad told me that he knew what he was doing. Each time he got more aggressive about it, so eventually I just shut up because I didn't want to get hit. I didn't comment when it became obvious we were lost. I didn't comment when the hill started getting steeper. I didn't comment when we wound up on the edge of a cliff. The drop was at least 1,000 feet my dad started walking parallel to the cliff about 10 feet away from it. I followed, because I figured at least there were trees and bushes between us and the cliff. That lasted all of 10 minutes. The brush thinned, and ledge we were walking on became steeper and thinner. When I finally found my voice and asked my dad if this was safe, my dad laughed and responded if you fall, go left, away from the cliff. Finally we got to the point where we physically couldn't go any further without guaranteeing death. A rocky outcropping blocked the ledge, leaving only an inch wide lip. We didn't have any technical equipment, and oh yeah we were fucking lost. My dad sized it up and suggested we keep going. I had no interest in plummeting to my death, so I tried a different approach to my protest. I told him that I still wanted to have enough time to get hot cocoa and pizza on the way back, it was a tradition of ours. Thank fucking god he agreed, because I genuinely believed that he would have led me to our death if he wasn't convinced. We started to head back and he told me to fall to the right this time. It wasn't too long before we encountered two massive problems, the snow was coming down so hard that we could barely see four feet in front of us, and, more importantly, the snow had covered our footprints. We were wandering along the ledge, trying to find where the fuck we came from, but we ended up going back and forth along the cliff for like 30 minutes. The only landmark we could find was the goddamn cliff, and with the snow buildup, it was getting really hard not to slip and fall. We sat down to try and brainstorm a plan. At this point, I was panicking. I'd grown up watching shows like I shouldn't be alive, and I was seeing similarities between the show and our situation. On top of that, one of my boots had gotten snow in it, so my foot was really fucking cold. I asked my dad what to do, and he came up with a brilliant idea to free climb down the fucking cliff. No gear, in a low visibility snowstorm. Fuck that. I bit the bullet and told him that I didn't think I would be able to make it, insinuating that he couldn't make it would have been a challenge to him. He hit me over the head and called me the R slur, but he accepted that I was too incompetent to go on his suicide mission. I suggested we'd try calling 911, but the idiot had left his phone in the car. I started crying, because I was 12, exhausted, cold, and convinced I'd either die from hypothermia or falling. My dad walked away because he didn't want to deal with my shit. After I'd cried myself out, I decided to keep looking for a way out, because that's what I'd seen people on TV shows do, plus it was getting dark and I really didn't want to spend the night on the mountain, because we were absolutely not equipped for those temperatures, I walked up a bit of a ways away from the ledge, and I explored a group of trees. I wandered around aimlessly for like 10 minutes before I stumbled across the most beautiful thing I had ever seen. It was a rock that was shaped kind of like a chair that I'd noticed on our way up. I walked back to my dad as quickly as I could, dragging my feet through the snow so my prints definitely wouldn't get covered. I dragged my dad back to the rock chair, and we finally got away from that fucking cliff. 
It probably took us another hour to actually find our way back to the car, but oh my god I just about cried. We were too drained to get hot cocoa and pizza, plus it was too late anyways. When we got home, my stepmom was practically hysterical with worry, and all my dad told her was that we went off trail and got a bit distracted. He never admitted that we got lost. When I was 18, I went back with a friend and tried to retrace our steps, but I couldn't recreate it. After some googling, it turns out we went off our intended mountain and were hiking along the gap between it and another 14er. This wasn't the only time my dad almost got me killed while hiking, and not hiking, but this was the most memorable. I was camping with my family and came down with a head cold, throat so itchy I couldn't sleep. I passed the night hour sitting in a chair by the lake where we were camping. About 4.30 that morning I hear someone walking on gravel near the campsite and I thought my brother-in-law was awake, he's an early riser. I walked over to his tent to grab a bottle of water. I figured if he was awake we would hang out. As I'm bending over to get water, some bark falls in my head and I hear my brother-in-law whisper through the tent door. He said look around, there's a raccoon out there somewhere, I said yeah, I think he's in the tree above me. Something just fell on my head. It was then I heard the growling. I turned on my flashlight and pointed it in the tree. There was a black bear staring at me and growling barely 15 feet above my head. I said a couple of choice swear words and walked over to my vehicle. I climbed in and watched the bear come out of the tree about 10 minutes later and wander off into the woods. Black bear in this part of Virginia aren't usually aggressive unless one, it's a mama with cubs or two, you scare one and have it cornered. This definitely fell into the number two situation and I feel lucky that bear didn't come down the tree after me was about 12 years old, at a summer camp backpacking out on BLM land in Northern California. We were a group of about 10 to 12 kids with two older counselors managing the pack. I was an energetic chap, and had made my way up a steep switchback trail coming off the river below that we had spent the day swimming in, making our way to a camp up on the mountain on our way back to the main camp. We had a few boys that weren't used to backpacking so there was a bit of waiting involved for the more experienced of the group, so I had made my way up the switchbacks then took a break waiting on the rest of the group by myself and sat down on a rock watching the rest of the group make their way up the switchback trial. While we were walking to the trail off the river, before we got to the switchbacks up the mountain, we passed a group of maybe four to five adults skinny dipping on the river, which obviously got a bunch of Christian camp pubescent boys all riled up, so of course we were all super chatty and laughing and making a ruckus as we made out way back up the mountain. So here I am by myself, quite a bit up the mountain switchbacks, on a steep slope with scrub oaks and fir and redwood trees lining the mountain slope the switchbacks are on, but with a pretty clean view through the trees down the switchbacks, watching the group make their way up the steep slope. I'm stand up after a bit, watching the crew, when I see someone watching the crew move up the mountain. I watch this figure peek their head out from behind a fairly large tree, then hide behind it. I watch this figure do this at least four to five times, before it walks between the tree it was hiding behind to another large redwood tree roughly 10 to 15 feet away in easily two to three strides. Then I see it peek out again behind the new tree, watching the group pretty intently, unaware that I'm staring right at it. I had recently seen a large, seven plus foot man at a store in a town not far from there before this experience, so as a young kid I naturally assumed this was just some weird, deformed and super hairy hippie dude who lived naked in the woods, and possibly a part of the crew of naked hippies we had passed earlier, and just wanted to see what all the commotion was about. What took me until my 20s to realize was that this man had long, auburn red colored hair on his arms and legs which I saw flowing as he moved from tree to tree, and only his face had bare skin, which was mostly flat with a wider nose than typical. I watched this figure watching us until the group made their way up to where I was, when I pulled the lead counselor aside and told him, hey, I think there's someone following us. As soon as I said it, the figure poked its head around the tree again, and I said see. Look exclamation mark and the counselor looked down and saw it too. The counselor looks at me, and says hey, let's not say anything and freak out the others, okay? So I complied and didn't say anything, and didn't really think of it again until I came across a Bigfoot sighting site late in my 20s and put two and two together and realized what I really did see. I still remember the counselor he was part of the Del Monte Pineapple Company family. I would live to talk to him again and compare stories. Had been fishing all day in a remote location, decided to pitch our swags, small one-person canvas tents, in a gravel car park to sleep the five or so hours until sun up. Only two of us and we have the swags laying side by side. I pass out and wake up in the morning, I get up and my friend seems really off. He says to me what the fuck happened last night? To which I had no idea, I'd slept like a log. Turns out a car arrived around 3 a.m., legit middle of nowhere too. Two guys got out, 
walked over to our swags and shone torches inside, had a good look at us, muttered to each other for a few minutes and then fired a gun into the bushes behind us and left. My friend said he was so afraid he couldn't move until the sun came up. This is Australia so it's odd for people to be armed. I either slept through the whole ordeal or was so scared my brain has malfunctioned and deleted the entire event from my memory. Sure enough, car tracks and an empty shell were right there so it definitely happened. Not me but my grandpa. We were moose hunting up in Temagami, on. Grandma was walking with him with a 12 ga looking for partridge while he had his rifle for moose. Grandma wasn't really paying attention, mostly looking at the ditch along the logging road. Grandpa stops her and says give me the shotgun right now. She hand it to him, he gives her the rifle and then takes aim and shoots one of the three timber wolves standing on the road directly in front. That's when my grandma looked around and realized they surrounded by an entire pack of wolves that had silently prowled out of the woods all around them. The one that got hit yelped and limped away, and the rest scattered. My dad and I walked out to the same spot the next day and the entire area was covered in wolf tracks. It was super eerie. We all hoped the one wolf didn't get too badly hurt by the bird shot chef, they were just doing what wolves do. When I was 14 years old me and my dad went to our yearly dads and kids camp in the Carpathian Mountains that we've been going to since I was little. It was late at night and the camp had gone to sleep. Me and my friend decided to go for a walk to the riverbank, which was theoretically still in campground territory, although there was no fence, to sit on a log and watch the full moon. At one point we girlies start singing as we used to do sometimes, and after a while notice a woman's voice coming from the other side of the small river, into the forest, singing a different melody, but saw nothing. We stop and stare at each other, knowing full well that in the entire camp there are only three moms, whom we knew personally and whose voices sounded nothing like the soft, eerie voice we had just heard. This campground was the type that you could rent, and neither the owners, nor any other party were there besides us, and the nearest village was one hour hike downhill. Like the stupid kids we were, we start singing again out of curiosity and sure enough, after a while we hear the third voice singing her own soft tune, carrying on for a little while after we stopped. Her voice was spine chilling and I tell my friend let's GTFO of there, but she wanted to prove that she was brave and stay there for a while. I told her I'd wait for her in the tent. Looking back, I see how dumb I was for not dragging her back with me, but at the time I was scared shitless and I told myself that surely my friend would shout if anything were to happen and that I'd wait in the tent and watch the trail on which she was supposed to come. She came back about 15 minutes later and she seemed oddly calm and content, almost spacey. She told me that she started singing again and that the woman's voice joined once more but that it became so loud and overpowering that my friend could not carry on her own song and she left. The next day we asked some guys to cross the river with us and help us investigate because daylight and their company made it all less scary. We found an old abandoned cabin nearby, but the grass in front of the locked door made it seem like nobody had been there recently. The following nights I could hardly fall asleep thinking of that soft voice, but we never heard her again. There are folk tales in these regions of I.L., some kind of mystical fairies or nymphs that dance or sing together in circles. The guys joked afterwards that maybe one of the fairies got lost and started singing to find the others. I don't believe in the supernatural but there are things that make me say I simply cannot explain everything. I still can't imagine how a woman could have decided to wander into the woods at that hour and sing back in that high-pitched, dizzying voice, for amusement or otherwise. Years ago, before weed was legal in Oregon, I was an engine boss for the Department of Forestry hunting down a wildfire caused by a lightning strike. We were deep in the forest and while traveling a nearly overgrown two-track road a quad suddenly jumped out of the tree line in front of us. The man driving it slowed down enough to stay just in front of my truck while still moving. He had a hat on and his face covered, body armor, and an AK-47 on his back. My fresh out of high school partner for the summer starts to roll his window down saying, I'm gonna tell this moron to get out of our way. I hit the window lock and told him to STFU. The quad paced us for a few miles, stopped and the man driving it pulled out a notepad and started to write down what assume is our license plate number. Then he turned and drove back into the tree line. The dude driving it never looked back at us, only used the mirror on the quad. I unlocked my partner's window. He says, well that was fucking weird. That asshole just slowed us down for 20 minutes and just bailed out into the trees. I explained that we had just been escorted through or near someone's clandestine weed or meth operation. They had granted a safe passage because they can see the same smoke as us and if we keep the fire small there won't be anyone else around to find their operation. He looked at me for a second said, oh that's why you told me to STFU. I was wondering why you were so tense. I was member of an avalanche rescue team. Some artists wanted to go up to the mountains, and I was asked to scout for a place where they could go. 
It was a bad weather, heavy snowstorms, and the cable car which lead up to a mountain restaurant was not working for the public. I took the cable car, drove up to the restaurant with my dog and found myself in a terrible snowstorm. I knew my way, though, to a stair which led up to a bridge which connected two mountain tops. There I waited for a while until the weather cleared up. When I considered the situation to be safe, I went up the stairway, crossed the metallic bridge to the other mountain top, climbed down until I was sure that the situation was safe for the artist once the weather cleared up. I returned, but on the middle of the bridge, I felt as if ice cold water were dripping on my neck. I knew this was not possible because I was tightly wrapped in my gear, covered from tip to toe. At this moment, I saw my dog, she normally had curly hair, but now she looked as if someone was pulling at every single one of her hairs. She looked like a soft hedgehog, and not moving at all, she was staring at me. At the same time, everything around me turned dark, as if the night had started, it was 9 in the morning. The metallic bridge had handles which were fixed on steel poles, and out of the poles came little, blue flashes. I tried to reach out to my dog for taking her and run off the bridge, but I barely could move. My black gloves seemed to be gleaming, and my whole body hurt as if someone was sticking needles into me. The, for a short moment, there was a bit of light. Walking on the small bridge, not seeing where I really went to, I grabbed my dog on her collar, stumbled toward where I thought the stairwell must be, we fell down a couple of meters into the snow, then I crawled to the closed restaurant, my dog beside me. The weather had become worse again, it was pitch black, but now, some flashes were twitching through the dark, but not from top to ground but in every possible direction. I still have no idea how long it took. My walkie-talkie wasn't working anymore, and the electricity for the cable car had shut down. So I had no other choice but to wait for the weather to clear up. Eventually, my dog and I made our way down, first through fields of fresh snow, then climbing down and finally walking through a wood. Once we had arrived at the station, some of my colleagues were already there, assembling with their rescue dogs, waiting for getting the go for flying up with a chopper and searching for my remains. Turned out I was in the middle of a really bad thunderstorm, witnessing Elm's fire and Picklesausen. I worked in the energy industry across the Midwest and constantly found myself outside at odd hours in the middle of nowhere. A few years ago I was in northern Wisconsin pulling a shift as the safety guy which meant I listened for a big zapping noise and then screams as the electrical techs did their work inside the substation. I was sitting on the hood of my truck just stargazing when I had this sensation in my head that something was out there and I was in absolute and complete danger. I've never felt so sick like that before. It was a bright moon so I could see pretty far out and I saw a coyote or a dog or something walk into the middle of the road. It was a little bit bigger than one but what freaked me the fuck out was that it stood on its hind legs. Not like your puppy does if you're trying to goad it to with treats or some shit. Straight up, its arms hung kinda down, its hind legs fully extended. I got in my truck and drove under the substation lights after that. Another time was I was working offshore on wind turbine platforms in northwestern Europe and I swear to fucking god I saw a ghost ship. We were waiting for pitch controllers to initialize so we could test them so we were waiting on the top of the tower for a smoke break. My co-worker and I were once again, stargazing, and we heard this sort of chugging noise. In the middle of the ocean it makes no sense unless it's super choppy and the waves are buffeting the tower structure but the seas were calm. There was a small light down at the base of the tower and aviation lights at the top which clicked on about every 5 to 10 seconds. It was dark, the lights clicked on, and I saw the outline of the very front of a warship. They clicked off, pitch black, back on, I saw the giant guns and a small little plane on the back of it on some sort of metal girder thing. Clicked off, clicked back on and there was nothing at all. I radioed our office and they said that there was no boats around our area except for their company boat. Nobody believed us when we got back to land. I know it was there though. I'm not an outdoorsman. Just a West Virginian from a holler. Anywho, all my family lives up in this holler. In the summers I'd stay with my mama and my aunt's house was up the mountain way a little bit, about a 15 minutes walk. I'd stay some nights with my cousin and it meant I'd meander my way up there past dark. A holler, if you're not familiar, means a valley between mountains. This meant my path was a worn down beaten path through the woods. I being the small child I was had no inkling about danger and just steamed along with my little flashlight. I thought it was extra fun to turn it off and try to be as sneaky as possible like the little stealth ninja I thought I was. One night I was stealthing along, likely pretending I was Xena or something, and came around a sharp bend. I hit something like a fur wall that smelled incredibly awful. I mean I just hit it face first, inhaling the fur up my nostrils. My Xena eskness was apparently not stealthy enough to not manage to frighten the bejesus out of some poor black bear and I ran face first into it standing up on his back legs. I was scared, the bear was terrified, 
and for a brief moment we both kinda stood there with my face buried into its fur confused. The bear thankfully skittered off and I made it to my aunt safely. I stopped trying to stealth it after. I went on a three-day pack trip with two of my buddies. The trail we were on was largely uphill on the second day's mileage, and from the reading we had done ahead of time there was only one good flat site and big enough to accommodate our tents. Sure enough, we hike up switchbacks all day and find a nice flat site near the top of the ridge. The trees surrounding this site were not the healthiest and there were a few downed trees nearby, but the standing trees were still alive so we called it good. We were pretty beat from the hike and hung over from drinking all the booze we packed on the previous night, so we get our site set up while some intimidating clouds start building on the horizon. The weather report had predicted a chance of rain, so this was not unexpected. When the first slow thunder rolled along the landscape we decided to get to bed. The rain, wind, and thunder gradually built over the next hour or two. I generally find rain and thunder to be relaxing, but this was something else. Big fat rain was coming down sideways while the wind was trying to tear my tent poles out, all while this angry thunder boomed everywhere around us. My mind was desperately trying to focus on my book rather than the swaying trees surrounding our tents and our proximity to the top of the ridge. One of the scariest moments of my life was when lighting struck somewhere right around our campsite. I was blinded by white purpley light and deafened by what I can only describe as an explosion at the exact same time. I reacted automatically by curling up in the fetal position and throwing my hands over my ears. One of my buddies was as wound up as I was after that, so we decided to move one of our tents about 50 feet to an area slightly farther from the trees and share the tent for the night. It didn't really matter, we were still surrounded by the gangly trees, I think we just needed to do something to feel like we tried. The third friend basically threw his hands up and said if I die I die and went to bed. Well no one died and we hiked out the next day, and try as we might we weren't able to identify where the lightning had hit. I'll never forget the moment that lightning struck. Long story short. I shot an elk that ended up dying at the bottom of a canyon. It took me a while to get to it, so I had to field dress it in the dark. About 5 minutes into it I heard a mountain lion scream. I couldn't tell how close it was because of the echo in the canyon. To add to the accident, I only had 2 rounds with me that day, and I used them on my elk. My radio didn't work at the bottom of the canyon either. Needless to say, this was the fastest quartering job that I had done to that day. I pulled the quarters away from the gut pile, took the back straps and hiked out of there as fast as I could. This was a number of years ago, I have made some major changes to what I put in my pack. When I came back the next day, I found that the quarters were undisturbed and there were no cat tracks anywhere. I won't forget hearing that scream all around me in the dark while I was covered in blood with no ammo. Got a few stories here. I was a corporate photographer for many years and the profession was also a hobby of mine. I was mostly confined to indoor studios for work, so in my own time I enjoyed hiking and exploring the outdoors and doing landscape photography. I was a brazen foolhardy kid in my 20s and did all the things you shouldn't do when hiking, such as not telling people where you were going, not packing enough of the 10 essentials, etc. I think I liked the idea of going out somewhere alone and coming back with photos of incredible scenery to post on social media as a surprise to my mom and friends but obviously that is incredibly naive and stupid. Anyways, the first story I actually wasn't alone, and had one friend with me. He was into fitness but not much of a hiker, and we decided to check out something called Vance Creek Bridge in Washington. It was an unused towering metal railroad arch bridge, some 350 feet over a creek and surrounded by evergreen forest. It was built for logging and very picturesque. The kind of thing you'd see in any quintessential Pacific Northwest media, and very much up my alley. I love a lot of post-apocalyptic stories and enjoy finding old abandoned societal ruin type structures. The bridge actually blew up in popularity because of Instagram, to the point it had to be closed down and was one of the first instances I remember of the viral nature of social media, and how one hashtag could lead to a surge in popularity and overcrowding and eventually ruining of an isolated location, which was inherently dangerous to begin with. Since then I take care to be more low-key of locations in my work, since I want to preserve the beauty of them and let people do their own research to find them. Back to the story, at this time Vance Creek Bridge was still relatively unknown and when we drove up a winding logging path to it we were the only ones there. It was a beautiful cloudy and somewhat rainy November day. The bridge cuts off at the end and doesn't actually meet the ground, and there are no railroad tracks leading off from it as again it isn't an activate railroad. It would be too high to climb, but during this time period there used to be this corrugated metal pipe rolled next to it that you could use as a platform to climb onto it. So we go up and start making our way across the bridge. It's beautiful from up there, with clouds rolling between the evergreens and intermittent sunlight shining down the creek valley. 
I'm taking tons of photos, and it becomes clear that the slats of the railroad are broken and missing in a few locations or in a poor state. Coupled with being damp from rainfall, one wrong step and you'd fall to your doom. I have my eye on my footing when I notice below between the slats are tons of bullet shells, stuck in the steel girders of the arch. I guess people come up here to shoot sometimes. My friend is enamored with the edge. He keeps peering over and starts saying weird things about how everything would be over if one were to jump. It surprises me and I nervously laugh and try to say things to console him since I can't tell if he's being serious or not. He keeps saying strange and different things, how problems in life wouldn't matter anymore if one takes the fall, in an oddly serene way. In the past my friend had told me some messed up things that had partly ruined his life, and I knew he wasn't in the best headspace. I was really concerned in that moment he would actually jump, so I changed the subject and asked if I could take a photo of him standing in the middle of the bridge, where I could line up the rails to a nice vanishing point, to which he obliged. I've heard this phenomenon described as the call of the void and it was strange seeing it grip my friend, for a moment there he really didn't seem to care if he died. We make our way down the tracks, at one point I have to hop across a gap over a missing track, and when I land my back foot starts to slide on the wet wood and I have that sudden this is it thought rush through my mind. Thankfully it's nothing and as we reach the other side and the ground gets a little closer with every step, I feel relief that we made it out and no one fell. I'm not inclined to go back on it after the way my friend acted and check my map to find that the trail loops down and around and back to where we parked. So we make our way through some uneventful woods and cleared logging areas. Eventually we make it to the creek, with the bridge looming over us some ways away. Looks incredible and as I'm about to take more pictures I hear something was past me followed by a thundering boom. Then another. Guns. I can see what looks like figures on the bridge and they're shooting down the creek valley, right at us. My friend goes oh shit. And we both nope out of there with a fresh jolt of adrenaline. Admittedly it was nice to see him have some renewed interest in living. I don't think the people shooting at us meant to, at least I hope not. We'd just come into the creek clearing and were far away, they likely couldn't see us. But who knows. In hindsight I should have been more cautious approaching my car on the other side, in case of ambush, but I was convinced they were probably just rednecks out there shooting. Two brushes with death was enough for me and so we headed home. It's been a decade since that event, and my friend is in good spirits these days, has a sweet job and bought his first house not that long ago. I have to do some work now but we'll get to my other stories in the comment of this one. For now goodbye and if I leave you with anything, it's if it looks treacherous and stupid, it probably is. Don't do anything rash solely for the gram. Friends have meaning, internet points have no meaning. When my siblings and I were young, our parents used to take us on random drives and we camped often. One time we were out really late, just searching for cool spots. My dad claimed to know of a spot nearby where we could camp in the middle of nowhere. He pulled onto this old, abandoned path, and drove for a bit, going through ruts on the road, hitting branches, etc. Super late by then, and pitch fucking black, like you could barely see 10 feet ahead, in the darkness on this road. All of us kids were tired as heck and getting cranky, so he pulled onto another off the beaten path spot and at like 2 am, we were setting up the old pop-up camper, with the sides that balance out on stilts. Got it all set up, put the food and other stuff we didn't need to use in the old Bronco, and all six of us crawled into the camper. About an hour later we heard some snorting outside that woke us all up, my dad whispers to stay quiet and gives my baby sister to my mom, with a look, like do. Not. Move. Whatever it was started snorting louder and bumping the bottoms of the beds which were on those scary ass thin stilt legs. All four of us kids were terrified and shaking. Finally after about a half hour, this thing wanders off, but we stay in the camper till morning light hits. We get out and look around and we were in this freaky burned out part of a forest. And there were several sets of bear-like paw prints circling all around the camper with weird chunks of flesh laying in a few spots. And the clawed paws were the size of dinner plates. We didn't say a word to each other as we rapidly disassembled the camper, jumped back in the Bronco and drove home, done with camping for the weekend. My dad, who has never shown fear of pretty much anything, still refuses to talk about this, 40 years later. Snowboarding with my two buds last year of HS. We stayed at a remote cabin with my parents' first few nights, then the parents left and we had a couple more nights by ourselves. Cabin wasn't exactly off-grid but it was way out and didn't rely on much electricity, but had running water. So no TV or noisemakers. We build a fire at night and sit around the living room table drinking beer and shooting the shit. If you've ever been out away from civilization and wild places, you know they're not quiet. There's always some ambient noise, wind, trees, insects, animals, all sorts of stuff. Well, then there's winter in the mountains. Snow has a quiet all its own, like a big, soft, 
white muffler marshmallow laid over everything. So there's quiet, then snow quiet, then the sort of utter soundlessness that is louder than a freight train. We heard the soundlessness. One friend's an Eagle Scout, so he's no stranger, and I've spent plenty of time outdoors. The third friend was more of a city kid, so he looked at us like we were crazy when we stood up and grabbed what was to hand, fireplace poker, big walking stick someone thought was kitschy. To this I day I don't know if it was a bear or mountain lion or worse, but for about five minutes, the air around the cabin was dead to all sound, with just my friend and me standing by the doors and windows, improvised weapons in hand. I've never felt so relieved as when the bird calls and dog barks and shit started back up. Backpacking trip on the Teton Crest Trail. This was my first time in grizzly country, and I had been heavily educating myself on bear safety literature in the weeks prior. Night 2 of 4, set up camp, had dinner away from the tent, get everything smelly into the bear canister, and got into the tent for the night. A few hours pass, and I'm awoken by a sad moaning sound pretty close to the tent. I wake up my boyfriend, and we come to the conclusion it must be a stray bear cub. All the bear literature we had read basically said, if you hear a cub, mom's nearby, and you're going to be perceived as a threat. Prepare to fight or die. So, we listened to the sound for about 10 more minutes while having a super mushy slash heartfelt conversation as they could have been our last words. At that point, we think well, may as well find out what's out there if death is on the table anyways. Boyfriend starts video recording on his camera with flash on, unzips the tent, and points it in the direction of the noise. Pull the camera back in to see the video, and. It's a porcupine moaning in delight as it gnawed on the sweat-soaked cork handles of our trekking poles. Never felt a greater sense of relief in all my life. We do decide we have to make him stop though, so we begin throwing every object in our tent at the guy to get him to stop. He eventually fucks off, and we bring the poles inside the tent vestibule. Porcupine comes back shortly after and continues to moan right outside the tent, all night long, begging we return his salty snack. I keep one of the gnawed poles mounted on my wall as a reminder of the fella. Walking through some thick woods in the absolute dark before dawn while heading to my deer stand. I prefer to not use a light unless absolutely necessary as to not spook the deer that I am there trying to kill. I am slowly and quietly making my way through the woods when all of a sudden something big starts running at me crashing through the woods and making the meanest and deepest growling type sound I have ever heard in my life. It stopped about 10 feet from me and then backed off a little. My heart jumps into my throat and I go into fight mode. The woods are so thick I can't run. I'm trying to think what animal this could possibly be but nothing is coming to mind. I live in South Georgia, US so rattlesnakes are the only animal I'm normally weary of while in the woods, I pull out my knife to defend myself because my bow and arrow wouldn't be too good in a close quarters fight in the woods. I turn my small flashlight on but couldn't see anything due to the thickness of the woods. I start to slowly back out of the woods and when I finally get out I run to my truck with my heart still about to beat out of my chest. When the sun gets up good later the day I go back, with a gun this time, to check my trail camera to see what it was that almost gave me a heart attack. When I looked at the pictures I almost couldn't believe what I saw on my computer screen. It was, a donkey. A fucking donkey was almost the absolute death of me. I don't know if this counts as the woods because of the location. But rather deep into the northern territory of Australia, close to Kakadu National Park, I was camping with an old beat up tent borrowed from a mate. It didn't have a rain cover, so pretty much just transparent mosquito net. Good enough. Middle of the night two creepy things happen. First, I woke up and looked around, enjoying the stars etc and suddenly it dawned upon me that there were stars everywhere. On the ground too. That's when I realized they weren't stars. They were spiders eyes. When you get up close to them, you can see their little baby wolf spiders, I think, or something that looks similar, just going about their business. Truly creepy to see so many of them though. Later that night I woke up to rustling sounds. Two dingoes were roaming about through the camp. Wouldn't bother me too much if I had a tent they couldn't see into. But for a good few minutes I was face to face with a dingo about a meter away from me. It just stared at me. Probably I was just nervous but honestly it felt like it was staring into me. I felt so perceived. And worse, I was just frozen. I could have scared it away but in that moment it didn't feel like that was the way to go. Anyway it trotted off eventually and I didn't sleep a wink the rest of the night. Went on a 54 mile backpacking trip with the local explorer scouts between 8th grade and freshman year of high school in the Marble Mountains of Northern California. Get dropped off at one point picked up at another. This was 1986 no cell phone no sat phone you are just on your own. Leader was a well known former navy man and local lifeguard in our small community. Roughly 25 people ranging in age from 13, me, to early 60s. 
trip has been going on for decades. Most of the trek goes without incident, being the 13 year old shithead that I was I pissed and moaned a lot at the time now I look back on it fondly. Anyway second to the last night there is a thunderstorm that rolls through the lake we are camped at. Mostly it has been no clouds at all to now. I climb into a tube tent with a buddy to keep dry and crash for the night after a 13 mile hike. Wake up to the sound of gunfire, I actually slept through the first few shots and my buddy wakes me up. A bear had broken into camp and one of the hikers was a cop that packed alone his .357. That was the gunfire I'm trying to chase off or kill the bear. Eventually we all huddled around a big fire and slept off multiple shots fired in the dark. In the end all that was really damaged were a few backpacks and a couple of food items as far as I know the bear lives to tell the tale. Apparently it got into a box of mac and cheese in someone's pack. Park bears that were accustomed to people would get trapped and relocated deep in the woods. So when they saw or smelled people they knew there was an easy food source. The next morning a helicopter with a bucket came through to put out the spot fires from the lighting strikes from the storm the previous night. Which was cool to see. Other than that around the same time lone female backpacker sunbathing in the buff is as odd as it got. Brave ladies all things considered. We respected their space and kept our distance, and they us. Out on a walk pretty deep in the woods that surround my house with my girlfriend, and after stopping at what I call the witch house, old decaying house built some time before 1800, we climb up on a big rock, maybe two stories tall, to get a better view of the forest. And out of nowhere, wooden shrapnel flies off in every direction. Misses us by an inch. Absolutely massive tree that was probably around before the US was founded snaps clean in half and falls towards us, sending pieces of forest everywhere. Takes down two more trees and it's all over in five seconds. Ten feet to our right is the corpse of a giant tree on top of two smaller trees. The wind pushes it a little to the left and it would have pulverized us no effort. We fuck off right after that. Come to think of it, every time I go near this house, weird shit happens. Every damn time. Wild boars in a place where boars only show up three or so times a year, an unmistakably air horn made sound coming from the top a tree that we could clearly see was empty, a fresh campfire fire made the old way in a place where I know damn well I am the only person who routinely visits. Just all kinds of shit that makes me feel uneasy. This isn't my story, but a close family friend. This happened probably 10 years ago if I remember right. This guy and his dad, he was probably late 20s at the time, were off hunting somewhere in the Idaho wilderness which is like most of the state, but they kept having weird shit happen the whole time. They were going up through this small draw type thing trying to trap some deer up in there for easy hunting. Upon entering the draw, they noticed it got super silent. Like even more silent than usual for a forest, no birds, no wind, no sound at all. As the pushed up through they started to notice something of a foul smell, not too bad but noticeable. The farther up they pushed, the worse the smell got as well a feeling they were being watched by something. At one point off in the distance they heard what he described as a horrifically distorted scream that didn't sound human, but didn't sound like any animal he or his dad had ever heard in all their combined years of being in the outdoors. They'd keep hearing this sound off and on getting slightly louder as they pushed on. Eventually the sound stopped as well as the smell, so they thought they'd passed whatever it was. Suddenly they heard the sound again and a rustle in a bush, and as they stood there waiting, a doe sprinted out of the brush and stopped in front of them, maybe 15 feet from them, and he said that the look in its eyes was that of pure terror, and that upon seeing them, its potential would be killers, it almost looked relieved. It then sprinted past them. As it did that, the most disgustingly putrid and rotten smell appeared all around them, enough to nearly make them vomit. Then that same scream they'd heard sounded, as if all around them, surrounding them from every angle, even from above, but this time it was different, as if it knew they were there and it was angry about it. As soon as they heard this they took off running, trying to get out of the draw, the whole time being followed by the screams, the smell, and the thunderous sound of branches snapping and brush being torn through behind them, as it seemed whatever it was was following them. Eventually they got out of the draw, and whatever it was stopped its chase and left them alone. To this day they will never go back to that region, even just to pass through. I don't know how true the story is, but when I was being told the story I could see the terror in both of their eyes as they told it, so I believe them. One summer night when I was juvenile, two of my friends and I snuck out of the house to explore the rural, very heavily wooded area. We followed the road about three miles down to a small bridge over the river. It had been a rainy summer, so the river had flooded into the surrounding area of woods below the bridge creating a swamp slash forest. One of us kicked some gravel off of the bride into the river below and no sooner than it had hit the water we heard a loud snap from the wooded area behind us. I grew up in the area so I considered we had just startled a deer and I continued to watch the river flowing below. 
My friend shined his flashlight off into the woods towards the direction of the snap and instantly grabbed my arm tightly and began trying to say my name. Just as I looked in that direction I saw what in no way related to a deer, but was very humanoid in figure. I'd say this bridge had to have been at least 12 to 15 feet above the river, and this humanoid looking thing stood almost even to the bridge in height. Instant horror shot through my body. A genuine icy vein, legs froze horror. This thing had no face besides sunken in eyes and then it shrieked. I finally had broken free from my horror paralysis and my other friends had already began running. I ran hard. I had ran cross country for 8 years and my friend who never did any physical activities was able to outrun me. I heard what sounded like metal scraping metal as whatever this thing was scrambled over the guardrail to the bridge, and another shriek was enough to really kick in adrenaline. We sprinted the entire way home. When we arrived back, my parents were very startled at how scared we were, and they weren't even mad we snuck out. We told them what we had saw and my dad just said he believed me and for us to go to sleep. The next morning my friends went home very traumatized and my dad drove me down the bridge where we saw claw-like marks in the metal guard rail which was now bowed like something had pulled it. We decided it was best to go home. The few people I've told the story to called me a liar, despite my friends being able to recount the story exactly as I had. I went back to the bridge four years after around the same time at night, this time loaded with a firearm, and it was peaceful and nothing ever happened. I don't know what I encountered that night. I tried researching the general description and listening to various nocturnal animal calls slash roars and nothing related. I've been told by some it is a Wendigo or the Rake, but I'm not sure I believe that stuff. Whatever it was slash wherever it may be now, it is extremely dangerous and I am fortunate to be alive. Came around a big pine tree and some thick stuff and was face to face about 15 feet away from a decent sized mama moose and her calf. She was facing me and looking right at me. Fortunately she was patient and didn't move a muscle while I carefully but quickly backed out the way I came. That wasn't even close to my scariest incident though. That would maybe be hiking through the mountains with my two dogs and getting charged and almost stampeded by a pretty big herd of cows that thought the doggos were wolves. Have gotten close to some grizzlies while fishing but that's usually uneventful in comparison, knocks on wood. About 6 or 7 years ago I was backpacking by myself with my fly rod and two dogs in the wilderness about 10 miles from the trailhead and walked through the last stunted grove of pines at the tree line only to walk right up in a sleeping mountain lion. He casually got up and slowly slinked off while shooting me this cat's side eye and switching his tail. Went to sleep early that day before the sun even went down, woke up at about midnight because my dog wanted to go out. Walked out of the tent with her and there is our kitty friend sitting in the alpine meadow just watching our tent. He bolted when the headlamp shined on him. Also tent related I woke up one summer morning that was cold in a rive bottom where I was fly fishing for the weekend and there was a rattlesnake sleeping literally right next to me, with the only thing separating him and me being my sleeping bag and the thin nylon tent wall. I moved, he rattled and I almost actually shit myself. Also got caught in a pretty tight canyon in a flash flood one time and had to haul ass across a creek that was quickly going from ankle deep to chest deep to higher ground. Fortunately was quick enough to get higher when the water was still below knee deep and easier to cross was fly fishing once, wading in a creek and lost my balance slightly and reached out to grab an overhanging limb to steady myself. Top of the limb was oddly soft until my brain connected that I had just grabbed a limb with a snake on top of it. Fortunately it wasn't venomous but I screamed like a little girl and fell in anyway. Was hiking alone once up a scree field after a rain in fucking tennis shoes, had a funny feeling and looked down to see a rattler coiled up about six from my foot. He never rattled, but I managed to do some feats of athleticism that I had no idea that I could do and turned around and went home. Got pulmonary edema while elk hunting in a wilderness area once at around 11,000 and had to backpack out with a ton of fluid in my lungs and coughing up pink stuff. That sucked but wasn't super scary I suppose. Knew what was happening and got lower as quick as we could. Saddled my own pony as a 9 year kid and the girth strap wasn't tight enough and that fucker took off as fast as he could go when he saw the barn and I ended up riding a horse upside down until we got there. Horses haven't really been my thing ever since. Almost stepped on a copperhead when I was a kid growing up in the south. It was sunning and so still that my dumb ass thought it was a rubber snake out there as a joke by one of my brothers so I just stepped right over it. Fell asleep in a homemade tree stand when I was a teen and fell out head first. Woke up right before my face hit the ground. Fortunately just a broken nose, torn shoulder labrum and an incredibly sore back. Didn't have enough time to be scared but somehow had this profound thought of being an idiot. Always time for that I guess. I used to be a guide a long time ago before I went to grad school and got a serious job that is a lot less fun, but I once had a client get pretty bad hypothermia, incoherent and starting to turn blue, not shivering anymore, 
after him getting stuck in quicksand in a canyon in remote AF part of Escalante because he was dicking around in it for a while and it solidified around him. Was like trying to pull someone out of a packed gravel driveway. Had to wiggle my fingers and hand while my face was next to his ass and in about an inch of water where I couldn't really breathe and reach down under his boot with all the reach I had to eventually break the suction. Popped right out after that and then into a sleeping back with boiled water and Nalgene's inside some very thick wool socks. That one for sure could have gotten both of us. Broke a ton of ribs and partially collapsed a lung with a hemothorax while backcountry snowboarding and had to hike out in chest deep snow with flail chest and barely able to breathe. Most miserable shit ever. Softball sized rock fell 30 to 40 feet and hit me in the top of my helmet rock climbing and left a rock chip embedded into the helmet. Neck and spine sore AF again. Was a dumbass last year and took my drift boat down a river I probably shouldn't have with the three of us and three dogs, in the winter, in February in the northern Rockies. Normally would have been fine but the water got so low due to dam cutting back on outflow that we were bouncing down the river, didn't get down the section fast enough and ended up rowing a drift boat down a canyon in the dark while bouncing off of the occasional rock. Not fun at all and one of the stupidest things I've ever done. Shot a giant bull in the nuts with a pellet gun on my uncle's ranch in Florida when I was about 12. Don't know why we thought it was a good idea to do that from the middle of the pasture. Barely got over that fence in time and have a nice scar to remember it by. Kids are stupid. I'm sure there are more but it's 3 a.m. in the Rocky Mountains and that's enough. Now that I think of it, I don't know if any were really more scary than the others. They were all uniquely adventurous and shitty but sort of fun? In a way? Not the fun fun way but the life experience kind of way. Sorry for the lengthy answer, I started thinking about it and it was a crazy rabbit hole. I suppose I should write a book. I went to summer camp as a kid and there were several options to take multi-day trips away from camp. The best one was what we called Senior Beach. The oldest boys and girls cabin would go camp by the lake for three days. No itinerary, just three days of chilling on the beach. They knew their target audience of teenagers. The year I went they changed how they scheduled the sessions so that our group went a week earlier slash later than it normally would. Funny story. There were two group sites. We had one and the other one was empty until the prison bus arrived. Apparently Juvie gets beach time too. So now we're sharing a campsite in the outhouses with a bus full of kids on a break from juvie. As an adult, fine. But as 15 year olds, we were shitting our pants. The smallest, most innocent girl goes up to one of the guards to ask him what they're in for. Surely if they're eligible for vacations we're talking about theft and other lesser crimes? Right? Right? The guard laughs and says oh, nothing that bad. Mostly just sexual assault and armed robbery. And that's the story of how we stopped using the outhouses and moved all of our sleeping bags so we could sleep in a circle on the beach. I was car camping well off the beaten path early one spring. Like, that Subaru shouldn't have been able to make it with the snow on these logging roads but we coaxed her through. The only other tracks were weeks old snowmobiles. Got into camp an hour or two before dark. Hike a few hundred yards from the car to a spot behind some boulders with a good view and go to sleep. Around 2 to 3 a.m. we wake up to the sound of chainsaws, a man yelling, and dogs barking. Legit was waiting for a chainsaw to rip through the tent. My dog was strangely silent. We stayed in the tent, hidden behind the boulders, for what felt like an age before my partner crawled out and peered around the boulder. A truck had gotten stuck in the snow just off the road and a guy was attempting to make a little traction thing out of small logs. He did not look happy and tbh we hid till they got unstuck around dawn. It's funny to look back on now but dang that was a scary way to wake up. I, female, 34 at the time, was hiking a brand new trail that opened up. I didn't realize it was newly open that weekend, so it was totally empty. I had hiked a number of kilometers in, and was getting quite tired. I had been working up my fitness after a badly broken leg. I was managing hiking, but I still wasn't able to run. As I'm walking down the trail, I hear some racket in the bushes, so I stop and listen and suddenly two men come racing out with machetes. I totally froze, knowing I wouldn't escape. I grabbed a camera lens to throw it at them, if I needed to. They hadn't seen me immediately though. Once they did, they must have seen the fear on my face as I was backing up away from them, and called out to me that they were volunteering to rid the bush of invasive species. They weren't expecting to see anyone as they didn't realize the trail was open to the public. They also politely gave me plenty of distance. I realized then how vulnerable I am hiking alone. Edit, I just remember this one too. Once I went camping by myself too. For safety reasons, I went to a campsite that wasn't secluded. This family took an interest in me, wondering why I'd go camping alone. I had a drink or two with the family one evening. But I felt creeped out by the husband, so I excused myself early. 
One night I heard the dirt crunching around my tent. I had a look outside but didn't see anything, and this is Australia, so I wasn't worried about animals. I kept my lantern on for maybe an hour just huddled in the tent though. I wanted whoever was out there to think I was awake. I finally decided to turn it off. Then as it became dark in the tent, I saw the outline of this man directly on my tent, his silhouette lit by the moon and then he ran away as he would have realized I could see him. I have no idea how long he'd been standing there. I was traveling with my ex on a bike around South America. This was 2011. We camped on the side of the road every other day and had gotten quite used to it. One day in northeastern Peru, road to Yurimaguas, it started getting dark and we found a nice little spot maybe one kilometer down a dirt road off the main road by a little creek. There were little villages every few kilometers. In the middle of the night, around 2 am I hear footsteps near our tent and then see a flashlight. It was really hot so we usually slept with just the mosquito net part of the tent door closed. I slept next to the door and my ex further in against the back wall. So I sit up, think someone is just walking home kinda close to our tent. Then this guy comes up to the tent, holding a flashlight in his left hand, pointed in my fist and his other hand behind his back and says to me in a bit of a drunken slur, in Spanish of course, that he wants me to get out of the tent and leave because he wants to rape my girlfriend. I'm a bit shocked and by then my ex had woken up, looking completely confused. She didn't understand a lot of Spanish so she asks me what he said. I pretty much translate it word by word and she freezes. I add that I won't leave her, not to worry and that she should try to get a hold of one of the knives we had used for dinner the evening before, put it behind her back and if things don't go well not hesitate to stab this guy and run. Next I tell him to relax, all is well and Therese no problem and I'm gonna do as he asks. So I get slowly towards the door, open the zipper of the mosquito netting and just as it opens up I ran at him, punched him in the jaw and he stumbles back and falls down. He gets up immediately and as I look around if Therese others around and to check on my ex he jumps into the creek, a good one to two meters drop, and runs off in the dark. My ex then starts saying the first word since waking up and asking me what he had said and just says we need to get out. So I tell her to grab her important things and her helmet quickly and we start the bike. I left my helmet, the tent, the sleeping bags and a bunch of other things and I drive up the dirt road back up to the main road. We keep going just about 5 minutes to the nearest village we had passed and find a little bar with lights on, music and a bunch of people there. We stop and go in and I start telling this older lady at the bar quickly what happened. There's a bunch of guys listening and I ask my ex and the lady if I can leave her there for a few minutes to go back to get the rest of our stuff, we were traveling on very little money and I really wanted to get our equipment back. They agree and two guys say they want to come with me. They grab some crow bars and we go back all three sitting on the bike. All of this couldn't have taken more than 15 minutes and as we get back the tent is gone, with everything in it. It was a pretty large tent and there is no way this guy packed everything up alone and carried it off. We walk around for another 20 minutes or so looking for them and eventually give up and head back to the bar. The lady at the bar offers us that we can stay in her house and her husband comes, brings us to their nearby place and we end up sleeping there and getting a nice breakfast. Our hosts also told us that that evening there had been some local holiday and a lot of people got drunk and then walked back to their villages. It took three months for my ex to agree to go camping again in a safe place on the northern coast of Colombia. She also told me afterwards that she completely froze when I told her what the guy had said and never had a knife or looked for it. I had a couple other interesting stories over the years, but this was probably one of the more scary ones, even though nothing had happened. When I was a young man I got paid as bear protection for an old prospector who didn't have a gun license. We were up in the Yukon Mountains, about 200 kilometers north of Watson Lake by road, 100 kilometers farther by Argo through brush and light trail. The first night we were there we set up a temporary bivouac, one thing we did was tie an unnecessary gas canister to a stick, this stick would have been about 15 feet tall, and it was resting straight up a tree so as to be out of reach of would-be curious creatures. During our month of excursions in those territories we went through every form of wilderness. I never once saw any wildlife, although there was plenty of sign that grizzlies were in the area. Tracks the size of my head, piles of scat like a beer can, these signs belong to giants, no doubt about it. Anyways as the month comes to a head we end up back in our original camp for the night before heading out the next morning with a full tank, courtesy of our gas canister. Except, the nearer we got to that canister we realized there was no gas left in it, because of the massive holes in the sides that leaked all our fuel. Scary part about it was, this gas can was still high up in that tree, which was a pine with a ton of unrustled slash unbroken branches, and lightly visible bear prints at the base. Meaning the creature that would have gotten to that can would have had to have been leaning up to reach an object 15 feet up in the freaking air. That bear had to have been 16 slash 17 slash 18 feet tall on his feet, 
because as far as I could tell, if he didn't knock the thing down then put it back up, and he didn't ever climb that tree, the only conclusion to draw was that he was one tall bastard. Kodiak grizzly bears are known to be over 10 feet tall but, up until this point, I never knew they could grow to be that large. It was eerie to see. My wife and I through hiked the Appalachian Trail in 2022. At this point, we are around 1,100 miles in and are somewhere in Pennsylvania. It's July, and it's raining. A typical day. We're hiking along, and her pace gets her to about 30 yards ahead of me. Just enough to see her still, but far enough that I lose sight of her around any kind of bend. I lose sight of her for a bit, and I can hear talking up ahead. Obviously just chatting with another hiker, it seemed. Well I found a bend and get her back into view, and it's some naked dude wearing absolutely nothing but a COVID mask talking at her, she did not stop hiking. Apparently the guy was a bit of a nutter because he was being apologetic to my wife about having run out of the woods, completely naked, shocking her etc and then saying that if she wants, she should kick him in the balls. Psycho shit. It's at this point that I see them both, and my wife just keeps hiking up ahead past him. Well the naked dude, who does not yet see me, then starts looking at my wife and begins shaking his pelvis and touching himself. And then he starts running after my wife. Oh fuck nah, so I grab a rock and get out in a full dead sprint chasing after him. He must have then heard me because he just bolted off into the woods. I literally never saw a glimpse of him after that. He just like, vanished like some little goblin. I catch up to my wife and I'm like what the fuck was that? And she really didn't have any idea what happened. She thought it was just another hippie hiker having the time of his life running around the woods naked. I'm like no, the dude's starting fucking chasing after you. And her face just went completely white and blank. She had no idea, and had she been alone it could have been a completely fucked situation. So we finally get to the road crossing and start texting all our solo female friends behind us to stay on high alert through that section. The craziest part was that we were a few miles in either direction from any type of road crossing, and I definitely didn't see any backpacking gear nearby. So we were really confused on just how the fuck he got up on the trail. He didn't even have shoes on either. So that was just about the end of us hiking any more than 50 feet apart from each other the rest of the way to Maine. When I was a teenager I went on a hitchhiking trip around Europe. On around day 10 I remember waking up and thinking back on my trip so far and thought to myself this is so much fun, we made it so much further than I'd ever imagined and we have had no problems at all. The rest of the day was filled with some uncomfortable situations and I seriously felt I had jinxed ourselves. We found ourselves outside of Nottingham, in a pretty fancy and busy rest stop slash gas station area. We had it in our mind that we wanted to go to Sherwood Forest, where Robin Hood used to roam, knowing fully well he is more of legend than a real historic character. The funny thing is that the cars that stopped for us as we were hitchhiking did not know where the Sherwood Forest was. It was almost like they had never heard of it. We waited for a few hours and started thinking we might camp at the rest stop, which was busy and probably not very safe. We had a rule that we would stop hitchhiking when it got dark, but on this day, with the allure of Sherwood Forest in our mind, we decided to keep trying even after it was dark. Suddenly a male in his 30s pulled over in a dark sedan and asked us where we were going. We explained we wanted to go to the Sherwood Forest and he said I have no idea where that is, but I will get you there. We had another rule. Never put our backpacks in the car's trunk because we wanted to be able to run away if we had to. The guy pops open the trunk and in pure desperation we broke our rule and threw our backpacks in there. I, as the male, jumped in the passenger seat and my female friend got in the backseat. We exchanged pleasantries for a bit and then he turns and looks at me and asks I don't know where Sherwood Forest is and it is getting late. Why don't we go back to my place and you two can sleep there. Tomorrow morning I'll figure out where Sherwood Forest is and take you there. I look in the rear mirror and see my friend with a worried look slowly shaking her head. I tell the man I appreciate it, but we really want to sleep in the Sherwood Forest tonight and he responds back no problem at all. He drives in silence, probably for about 5 to 7 minutes and then he looks at me and says so you guys have been traveling for a bit huh? It's probably difficult to eat a proper meal on the road and have a nice shower? If you come home with me I can make you a really good meal and you can take a shower and clean up. You can even wash your clothes if you'd like. Both of us started getting a little worried at this point and I said I really appreciate it, but as I said we have plans to sleep in the forest tonight. He again said that was no problem and he would get us there. We drive for a few more minutes and he picks up his cell phone, this was at the time when cell phones had just gotten common, and he says the following to the person on the other end hi babe. I just picked up two hitchhikers. One male and one female. I'm bringing them over in a few minutes. And then he drives into what to us seemed like a very unsafe area of Nottingham with police cars and ambulances on several street corners. He parks by an apartment block and again asks us if we want to come in and eat. 
We say we prefer to wait in the car and he walks inside. We look at each other with a worried look. What should we do? My friend asks, should we make a run for it? What about our backpack and our passport? We keep debating for probably five minutes what to do. We had a mace that we were prepared to use if it came to it. And then the man comes back with juice boxes and two big map books. Turns out he was the nicest person ever. A volunteer at the local hospital, a Christian and had done volunteering in several countries. 45 minutes later we made it to the Sherwood Forest. It was pitch dark. He had no idea where the entrance was and he kind of reluctantly left us on this small road that we assumed led to the Sherwood Forest. We take our backpacks and start walking. Remember, it is pitch dark, probably around midnight, if not later. We can't see much in front of us and we just follow this road into the forest. We eventually find a patch of grass and say let's pitch our tent here and we do that. After the tent is up we immediately decide to go to bed. We strip down to our underwear and get into our sleeping bags. We talk about how crazy the day was and we almost fall asleep when we hear a car coming. It stops not too far away from us, maybe 100 feet away. We lay there listening as we hear a car door open. Silence for a bit. And then a man screaming Oscar. Get the fuck back here. Oscar. And then a loud sound. Was that a gunshot we asked ourselves? We hear the car starting up again. The lights are beaming right at our tent. He revs the engine a little and then we see the car driving straight toward our tent. We freak out and open the tent and run out and straight for the woods. The car turns and stops to look at the freaks who pitched a tent right in a small roundabout in the middle of the road. The freaks who now are running into the woods in their underwear. He drove off, and we decided to pitch our tent somewhere else. In the pitch darkness. The next morning we woke up and opened the tent to see 30 small school children staring at us from inside of a building. Turns out this was some kind of summer camp. One of the people working there came out and offered us cup of tea and we sat there laughing at the weird day we had. Spring break 2006, my high school sweetheart and I decide to give it another go. We had both moved far away for home from college, she in Seattle and me in Spokane. We decide we're going to take this big American West Road trip, down through Utah into Arizona Canyon country, and back up along the coast. First leg of the trip went well, made it to Joshua Tree and had some fun in the desert. I forget exactly why, but we decided to do the first halfish of the way back on the east side of the mountains. I think one of my friends said he was in Vegas and could give us some help. We end up deciding to cross the mountains near Tahoe. We get to the area late enough that it makes sense to camp out and cross the pass the next day. We're at a low enough elevation that this is reasonable. There is some snow on the ground but we came prepared for that. So we head up some random mountain road that she found and set up camp. All seems to be going well as we set up camp and get ready to settle in for some sleep. As we're laying down to rest we hear very clear steps in the snow around us. We look at each other, confirming we're both hearing the same thing. I say something innocuous, a hey man, kind of thing. The steps stop. We brush it off and get ready to settle into bed. After a few seconds, we hear them again, like they're directly outside our tent. I say something more aggressive, to the effect of hey motherfucker, we can hear you, what the hell is going on? The steps stop. A minute or two later they start again and I barbarian rage my way out of the tent only to find that there were no fresh footprints around the tent, despite both of us literally hearing them moments earlier. I shit you not, I don't think I've ever moved faster than I did breaking down that camp. We threw shit in bags, threw bags in car and got the fuck out of there as fast as we could. We got back on the road and drove toward the pass. It was snowing like a motherfucker, and they told us we couldn't cross without chains. In my panic state, I couldn't get chains on my tires. A kind trucker helped me out and we made it over the pass that night. The real fucked up thing, though, is after the acceptance that the last attempt to get back together didn't work. I didn't speak to her for a few years not out of malice as much as respect for space. Close to a decade later, we reconnected through a mutual friend. We were talking about whatever and she brought up our road trip. She mentioned that she'd listened to an outdoorsy podcast that talked about weird shit happening in the exact spot we had been. In that moment I felt this rush of memories and all of the details of that night came back to me in vivid detail. Apparently my trauma response was to block it out, but being reacquainted with the details brought the entire experience back. Long story short, I believe in ghosts slash spirit slash whatever the fuck you want to call them. And a big reason why is how my body reacts whenever I tell this story. My arm hairs are fully at attention and I wish they weren't. Was elk hunting in the Sawatch National Forest with my dad and two uncles when I was somewhere around 14 to 15. You'd see the occasional hunter passing through but other people were pretty scarce. One day we were just kind of hanging out so I took the four-wheeler for a ride. I was riding about 45 minutes when I came up on a ridge. 
This area was not really viable for hunting as it was wide open and you could see for miles, but there was no one around as far as the eye could see. I got off the four-wheeler to look over the ridge and just take it in. As I was walking up the edge I saw about 15 to 20 little miniature crosses in the ground, like a homemade makeshift graveyard. The hair on my neck stood up and I got this feeling like I should be literally anywhere else but here right now. I got the hell out of there, pinned it all the way back to camp and never told anyone what I saw. I still think about what it could have been. My best guess, based off how old they looked was maybe an old cemetery from a Native American tribe, but don't think that really aligns with crosses. I, but I still get an uneasy feeling in my stomach every time I think about how I was completely and utterly alone on that ridge and maybe each cross that was there was for someone else that had wandered up there alone. I went out hunting really early one morning to get in my tree stand before sunup. While I was getting situated I heard the branches moving around in the tree above me, it was a bit more breezy that morning so I didn't think too much of it. Once I got up there I did the usual routine and I sprayed myself with scent blocker situated my stuff and just sat there waiting for daylight and listening to the soothing sounds of the fall leaves rustling above me. This particular year I had set up two tree stands, one for me to sit on and the other to set my bag on, with my calls, snacks, extra arrows, etc., so if I wanted something I could just reach over and grab whatever I needed. Once the sun came up a nice looking deer walked right in front of me, before it got in range I stood up and drew on it. As soon as I had a full draw an absolutely huge mountain lion came down the tree from directly above me and sat on the extra stand next to me for a few minutes before crawling the rest of the way down and wandering off. Trying to hold absolutely still with a bow drawn back pointing away from the direction of it was painful. The few minutes felt like an hour. Once it left out of my peripheral sight I let down my draw packed my stuff and left for the rest of the day. This was the most horrifying hunting trip I have ever had. I was in my early teens, and both my parents worked at night, so I'd often be sent to my grandmother's acreage out in the country after school or on weekends. There was absolutely nothing to do there, unless I wanted to watch TV or play solitaire on her ancient PC. So, naturally, I spent a lot of time outside, exploring 10 acres of unmanaged woodland. As long as I was inside by dark, I wouldn't get in any trouble. So, one autumn evening, as I'm heading back to the house a bit later than I should be, I can't see all that well, but I hear something snap out of time with my own footfalls. The light is fading fast, and what light there is is directly in my eyes as I whip around to see what made that noise. I can catch a glimpse of something canine, a coyote my brain said. Not a big threat to most, but I was a late bloomer, and a small kid. I can't bear the sun right in my face, so I continue walking home, taking careful note of the sounds around me, stopping to confront whatever was behind me whenever it sounded like it was coming closer. Eventually the light fades, and I still haven't gotten a proper look at this thing, but I can see the lights of grandma's house through the trees. At this point I'm thoroughly worried, because I can barely see my own feet, and I'm still being followed with only a large stick in my hands and no light, because I was a dumb kid who couldn't manage time and thought my grandma's property was safe. I finally break the tree line, and am greeted with light, but nothing follows me out. My curiosity is battling my fear, but eventually common sense gets the better of me and persuades me to go inside, rather than back closer to the woods. I get inside, and get a brief admonition from my grandma before she tells me to take the dogs out before dinner. After not getting a word in edgewise, I take the dogs, a chihuahua, and a dachshund so not really dogs a faic, into the fenced portion of the yard and wait for a while while they explore their domain. This time I do have a light with me, because both are usually reluctant to go back inside and will hide, so sometimes I need to find them. I get tired of standing around outside, and Duchess is nowhere to be seen. I last saw her going around the house toward the back. Toward the woods. At this point, I've forgotten all about my stalker from earlier, and figure the she, the dachshund, is digging yet another hole in an attempt to burrow under the fence. So I go round back to retrieve the dog, and she's just staring through the fence, very tense. She growls as I approach, which sets me off, Duchess never growls I sweep my light out back, and catch a glimmer as I pass over something. So I go back to it and change the beam to a smaller focus. Standing about 30 yards from the fence are two gray wolves. Completely motionless. Now, I've raised wolf dogs. I know the difference between wolves and dogs. These are big. Huge. These are not dogs. I quickly pick Duchess up, and keep my light shining on the wolves as I back towards the side of the house. As soon as I round the corner, I turn around and book it straight for the door, and burst in out of breath, and my grandma says I'm white as a sheet. I tell her what I saw, and she calls bullshit, blaming my overactive imagination and I'm a drama queen, which as a young man, I found quite offensive. And it doesn't matter anyway because nobody is going outside anymore tonight. 
In the morning, I pester my mom when she comes to get me, and she believes much the same as my grandma, but humors me by going with me to check the area. Sure enough in softer patches of soil, we see canid prints. Way too big to be a dog. From then on I am forbidden from wandering the woods. The Forest Service's official statement is that there are no wolves where I live, but I know better and I'm glad I don't have much reason to go out into the country in my adult life. I can still feel the strange mix of emotions remembering that day. Fear, curiosity, confusion, a strange mix of awe and terror. Just one more time in my life I was incredibly lucky to survive. Okay here's my crazy one. It was so long ago, about 13 years, it almost doesn't feel like it really happened. So I was about 21 at the time living in Arizona. Started really getting into hiking. I'd frequently go into the Superstition Mountains on a whim. Probably could have planned my hikes better but what are you going to do? So one day I decided I was going to go on my first solo overnight hike to a waterfall. The drive out was long. A bit longer than I anticipated and I think I only arrived to the trailhead with a few hours before sunset. So I hiked what I could and found a spot to set up my tent and sleep. I should note there were maybe two other cars at the trailhead and I didn't see anyone else on the trail so far. Just as I'm laying down ready to doze off I hear something scratch one side of my tent. I thought it was probably an animal and will go away soon. Didn't hear any other sounds like that after. But it did scare me a bit and I couldn't sleep so lay there awake. Maybe 30 40 fifths of a minute passed and I heard another noise, I set up my tent on an area that had a lot of gravelly rocks. This sounded like a footstep coming from the left side of my tent. Then I heard the same noise coming from the right side. 10 minutes go by and another footstep from the left followed by one on the right. 10 more men same thing. Again. I'm scared. I'm trying to convince myself that this is an animal of some kind but the steps are too perfectly timed. I fully believe there are two people out there. I'm still inside my tent. It's pitch black at this point. I have a knife and a handgun which I brought at the demand of a friend. So I'm sitting in the tent. I haven't moved or made a sound. I have my knife in my left hand and gun in the right facing where the footsteps are coming from. My logic here is maybe they don't know who is in the tent. Could be three dudes and not one young girl alone in the middle of nowhere. I didn't want to step outside because I thought it would leave me vulnerable. I tell myself if I hear one more footstep I'm firing a warning shot. Sure enough the same synced up steps. I fired blindly through my tent. My ears were ringing like crazy for I'd five minutes. After that I didn't hear anything for 45 minutes then the steps started up again. Same as last time. One from the left then one from the right. They waited. Then again. And again. And again. I fired another shot. I had run through the thought that I legitimately could die tonight. How much I'm going to miss my parents and sister. All the fear and sadness slowly started turning into anger. If there were people out there I wasn't going down with a fight. After the last shot I think maybe an hour passed. I still hadn't moved a muscle or made a sound. Maybe me but I peed through my clothes while I sat waiting. Sure enough here we go again. Except this time I heard a footstep from both sides at once. Still spaced out by about 10 minutes again. 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 I fired another shot through the tent. I now had a plan. I was so angry and tired at this point I maybe was feeling a bit reckless. But my plan was to wait until the footsteps got close enough then I was going to cut through the tent, zipper would take way too long and try to shoot whoever was out there before they could get to me. I waited but those were the last footsteps I heard. I sat there in the same position until the sun came up. I finally got the courage to go outside of the tent. I couldn't tell if there were any footprints or not. But I packed up my tent and finished my hike. Saw one guy along the way. I've never backpacked alone again. I really don't think that was my mind playing tricks on me although this story seems almost unbelievable to me after all these years. I guess I'll never know. But there are all kinds of crazy stories about hiking in the Superstition Mountains. This is through my neighbor. I've lived next to this guy since I was a wee lad. This guy is the biggest outdoorsman I've ever met. At the time, he was in his late 50s, never been married or had kids. He has hunted slash fished everything Colorado has to offer. Every year on the same week, he goes up to find shed antlers, and whenever he comes back, I usually catch him while he's working in the yard, and he shows off his finds. When he returned, I saw him a few times throwing out his garbage or whatnot, and he would not talk to me. Head down, one or two words, and that's it. Finally, after two months, he told me, like always, I was sitting around the fire, letting it die out. Once there's just a bed of coals, I like to howl and listen to the coyotes before bed, so I howled and a few coyotes howled back. Then I heard this deep bellow slash scream come out of the aspen grow across the meadow. 
I didn't think much of it and decided to let out another howl about 30 seconds later. I was cut off by this screamish bellow only this time it was damn near on top of me, it was so loud and deep I could feel the rumble on my jacket. In 30 seconds, this thing had cut the distance and was coming for me. I ran into my camper and aimed my pistol at the door all night. At daylight I hooked up and hauled ass home. He'll never go up there again. If I heard the story from literally anybody else I probably wouldn't even remember or care to tell the story again. But hearing the words he'll never go up there again come from a man who practically lives on that mountain completely scares the shit out of me. I was camping with some friends in northern Idaho. One of them was a city kid who had never done any deep woods camping before. Back then, whenever I was deep in the woods, I'd have a handgun on me. The city kid knew this and had been a little unnerved by it, but was pretty much fine with that state of affairs. We set up camp the first night, and sat around the campfire. We fried up some kind of camp mess for dinner and just chatted. Some of the guys drank. Both the city guy and I abstained. Then we headed back to our tents. I had brought my bigger tent because the city guy didn't have one and he was crashing with me. In the small hours of the morning, something I woke up to something crunching around outside our tent. I was a little unnerved, but I'd had big critters wander through camp before, and it had been fine. But then I looked over and city guy had dug my CZ 75 9mm out of my bag and is huddled in the corner, absolutely terrified. So now I have a real problem on my hands. This dude is way more of a threat to life and limb than whatever is wandering through the campsite. Fortunately I was able to talk him down and convince him to lay the gun down on the floor of the tent, at which point I took it and cleared it. In the morning we found big, clear elk tracks all over our campsite. To this day I'm thankful I didn't get air hold just because some elk decided to see if the grass was any good next to the, the ashes of our campfire. Few years back I was camping on a friend's land with two other friends in Louisiana. We'd been out there a couple days and had camp well established. It was after dark and my buddies went to gather more firewood. I stayed at camp to tend the dwindling fire with what little kindling we had. About 15 minutes go by of me just sitting in silence vibing when down the hill at the tree line, about 50 feet away, I hear this unnatural screeching and see the foliage rustling as I turn my flashlight towards the sound. Almost immediately the thing screeches again and runs along the tree line in the woods just beyond the reach of my light, but I can still clearly follow the disturbance in the branches and bushes. I can hear this thing crashing and stomping through the brush, and as I'm running after it my buddies are peeling back toward camp on the trail hollering my name thinking it was me screeching in distress. We meet in the middle of the path and they see the rustling brush and hear whatever it is screech one last time as it veered away from all of us and further into the woods. We're all positive it wasn't a bobcat or cougar, we've each heard what those sound like before, and from the way its footfall sounded it was large and bipedal. It isn't entirely out of the realm of possibility that we had encountered a meth head that had gone feral, that's a definite problem in that part of Louisiana. But we're not entirely sure even to this day what the hell it was, there's some strange shit down in these swamps and bayous. In the summer of 2014 my dad and I decided to go camping on Standing Indian Mountain here in NC. We had hiked through it one time while hiking the Appalachian Trail and loved the Native American myths and tales we had heard about the mountain, figured we'd stop and stay a while this time around. Anyway, we got to the clearing at the top and set up camp before dusk, started a fire, ate chow, secured our belongings in a nearby tree and crawled into the tent. We were playing cards for a couple hours and passing the time when suddenly everything got quiet. No critters chirping, no buzzing. Silence. My dad and I give each other a quick look and reach for the weapons we had brought, I had a combat axe from my time in the army and dad had his e-tool. We sat there for what felt like an eternity but had to have been just a few minutes, but heard nothing. It was eerie. Suddenly we heard a large thud and some tumbling, sounded like something big got thrown our way. We started making noise assuming that it was an animal that had tumbled towards us but again heard nothing. We sat there for a few more minutes before mustering the courage to unzip the tent and peek out. We slowly made our way to the fire that was between us and the wood line, where we heard the sound come from, and stoked it while adding a few logs, all the while keeping our heads on swivels. I go back into the tent to retrieve the flashlight I should have grabbed initially and start getting a good look at our surroundings. Our food and possessions are still hanging from the tree in the wood line, untouched. But not 15 feet from the fire was a very large rock that hadn't been there before, the source of the noise. What was eerie about it was that it was a good 30 feet from the wood line where the rest of the rocks its size were nestled, and it was no small rock, a grown man might have been able to toss it 5 to 7 feet max. It was big. The eeriest part about all of this is that we were uphill from the wood line and the rest of the rocks. We had purposefully positioned ourselves at the highest point because there was a chance for rain that night. There's no way that it could have just rolled towards us. 
My dad believes it may have been a Squatch or one of the mountain men that have been reported in the area over the years. There is no evidence they exist but he is held to his beliefs regardless. After the incident, I started looking for answers myself. During my research I've found multiple reports of these types of incidents in the past. What's more, the Appalachians are the oldest mountains in the world and are said to hold many dark secrets, including unexplored cave systems and weird creatures that haunt some of the mountain's inhabitants. Up until that point in my life, I had scoffed at the notion of such things even existing but am definitely more open-minded now. I wish there was an explanation for what I experienced. Definitely scary. I was about 16 bow hunting along a creek that ran through our farm in south central Missouri. Because the creek was at the bottom of a valley, once the sun drops below the hillside the light is gone. At the time, I just had a flip phone and a tiny button light that was used for illuminating the fiber optic pins on my sight. Enough light in the dark to make sure I don't step in a hole but not enough to light up the nearest tree. There are two cleared paths that converge at the creek crossing where I parked my truck. As I get closer to the point, I hear something breaking branches very methodically like a slow paced walk. I stop and point my light up at the sound. The only thing I can see are two glowing eyes picking up my faint light source. It stops cold in its tracks as did I. My heart was racing at this point. I would see the eyes blink but they were locked on me. I knocked an arrow just in case. I never thought I needed a sidearm in that area. I started yelling and making noise, although my voice was incredibly shaky from the adrenaline. The animal took a few quick steps towards me then stopped before it broke the tree line. It stopped advancing when it saw I didn't budge. I ran across the creek and got in my truck as fast as possible. You're never supposed to run because it will trigger the predator instinct, but I clearly wasn't thinking slow movements would save me in the moment. I get back to the house, out of breath and shaking like a tree, yet nobody believes what I thought I saw. The next day we had neighbors saying they checked the cameras and there was a mountain lion on it. We hadn't had a sighting in 15 years. From then on, I never leave for an evening hunting without a powerful flashlight and a pistol.